Thank you, Sarah. Right, good morning. Uh, I'm Jim. Um, I'm here for the morning session, and I look forward to engaging uh, wholly with you. Uh, I mean, let's make it as interactive as we possibly can. Uh, interrupt, uh, shout out, make noises, ask questions, whatever, uh, over the course of the morning, and I'll do my very best to answer them. Um, because we are a small group, we're going to be doing some group work uh, uh, in the second half of the morning, uh, and it would help me if I knew who you are. So very quickly, can we just go around, tell me your name and what organization you're representing, and just let me get a feel for who's in the room. Can I start with you? Okay, brilliant. So there's a combination of NGOs, uh, public sector, and a couple of academics. So brilliant. That's a great, great start, great mix. Um, uh, I suppose if you look at it from an academic standpoint, what you're going to get this morning is Sustainable Development 101. So um, I, I apologize in advance if it, some of it is a bit simplistic for those of you who may already be familiar with some of the concepts that lie behind sustainable development. But I'm doing my best to try and introduce it to those who have never heard of the concept and uh, you will need to know uh, a little bit at least about what goes on in sustainability in order to successfully pursue your application to Interreg. Um, my background is uh, a combination of uh, the academic and the uh, interest. I started life as a teacher. I spent a long time overseas in Central Africa. Uh, I came back to Northern Ireland and took up the job of running WWF Northern Ireland, the uh, International Conservation Organization. From there, I segued into uh, the directorship of the Sustainable Development Commission. That the, was the government's advisory body on sustainable development with offices uh, in a, the four nations of the UK. Uh, and when that was prematurely closed by the Cameron Coalition, uh, I took up a role with Sustainable Northern Ireland, which uh, works principally but not exclusively with local authorities, with councils in Northern Ireland to try and embed and put into practice uh, sustainability obligations. In Northern Ireland, we do have a couple of bits of legislation that uh, obliges councils and central government departments to pursue sustainable development. And in some ways, uh, there is parallel legislation in place in Scotland. So uh, we'll try and bring some of that as we go along. Um, uh, the organization Sustainable Northern Ireland provides these services. We help uh, organizations to put together sustainability strategies to meet their obligations. Uh, we provide training. Um, we help with community planning, a relatively new concept for Northern Ireland, but one that's well embedded over here. Uh, and I do some special work on sustainable food and on climate change, where I am on various advisory bodies in Northern Ireland on that, uh, on that stuff. So, sustainable development. What is it? Um, the classic definition is this. Development that meets the needs of the current generations without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And that stems from 1987. There was a, the Brundtland Commission was set up and wrote a report, Our Common Future, looking at uh, how uh, we get from where we were then to a, a long-term future without making a mess of the earth. Um, and it's always thought of as uh, belonging to three pillars, uh, the economic pillar, the environment pillar, and the social pillar. And uh, the idea uh, at heart is that each of those has equal weighting and that you don't pursue one at the expense of the other two. So a perfectly balanced program is one that gives equal um, credence to uh, the criteria involved in those three pillars. Um, 
the new word that's coming into play more and more in relation to this field is resilience. The idea that we're going to be uh, able to withstand the shocks, the big things, the floods, the droughts, the earthquakes, the volcanoes uh, that occur to places uh, around the globe, as well as the stresses. The stresses are a little bit more difficult to deal with in many cases. We're talking about social deprivation. We're talking about poverty, whether it's fuel poverty, food poverty, um, the, uh, uh, the stresses involved in an aging population and the health implications of that aging population. These are stresses in the new terminology of resilience. There is a brilliant program uh, funded by the Rockefeller Foundation called the 100 Resilient Cities. Uh, 100 cities around the world have been chosen to uh, interact with each other with some funding from the Rockefeller Foundation and to find mutual uh, benefit, mutual understanding in dealing with the stresses and the shocks. Uh, this city that we're standing in is one of the 100 and Belfast has just in the last month been accepted into the programme as well. So around the UK, I think it's Bristol, Manchester, London, Glasgow and Belfast uh, are all in the 100 resilient cities. It is a, I, I really, I'm very impressed with the programme. I recommend you have a look at their website, 100 Resilient Cities. Uh, there's so much to learn from that. Uh, these are the sustainable development principles uh, as um, embraced by uh, earlier UK governments. Um, I'm not going to stand up here and be critical of the current government, which called itself the greenest government ever, but, uh, you know, they're not. And uh, the, uh, uh, these principles were brought into play from an earlier uh, government, the, uh, the Blair uh, years, and, uh, and, and very carefully worked out and thought about. And they still apply as strategic goals, as strategic principles that lie behind uh, sustainable development wherever it takes place. The Scottish government adopted pretty much the same uh, principles. The Northern Ireland government did the same, although in Northern Ireland we added one more principle on innovation, uh, which isn't represented here. But here we have the two basic ideas of sustainable development are, can we ensure a strong, healthy and just society? And you know what's not to like there? Can we do that while living within environmental limits? And that sometimes is the challenge. There are uh, so often projects which are government-sponsored, government-led, which drive an economic benefit on the basis that a wealthy society, you know, the, uh, the rising tide lifts all vessels. Um, and economic development of that sort can often be at the expense of the environment. We have regulations in place, we have laws in place to prevent excessive uh, damage but, uh, you know, it's a difficult balance at times. There's no question about it. So the idea is to live within environmental limits. There is a concept that um, we in Scotland, in Northern Ireland, in uh, all of the developed countries around Europe, we're living what are called three-planet lifestyles. And the basic idea there is if everybody in the world consumed stuff the way that we do in this country, We'd need the resources of three planets to keep on going. And we don't have three planets, we've only got the one. And so the concept is we need to try and reduce our consumption to live one planet lifestyles. Um, it's a very well developed concept and it's been you know, worked out over a number of uh, years. Uh, the sadness is that we're not anywhere near getting to one planet lifestyles. We're still living profligate. Uh, 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 lifestyles in terms of the way we consume stuff. Now, the, uh, th those principles uh, are then complemented by uh, these as sort of other aspects of sustainable development. Circular economy, something which is uh, uh, coming more and more to the fore. It's using resources efficiently. It's trying to make sure that there's a minimal amount of waste going into a system. If you're in manufacturing, the idea is that instead of putting, throwing stuff away at the end of your manufacturing process and it's finishing up in a hole in the ground, which is what we've been doing since the Stone Age, uh, that that so-called waste, there is another use for it, either within your own organization, your own industry, 
or by uh, offsetting it to uh, some other uh, user. Uh, that's uh, an efficient circular economy. Natural capital, there are um, uh, another way of looking at things is through something called the five capitals. Uh, so that is uh, natural capital, uh, financial capital, manufactured capital, social capital, human capital. Um, and the idea of natural capital uh, embraces both renewable resources, whether it would be uh, growing trees or fresh water, or whether it be uh, finite uh, capital, fossil fuels, for example. Um, but natural capital uh, and the, uh, the goods and the services that it supplies for people um, are essential. We need to hang on and make sure that there is that natural capital for our children, for their children, and their children after that. And finally, communities. Uh, the whole concept of community planning is something which, uh, again, is terribly well developed in Scotland, where uh, people are consulted widely to try and advise on how uh, 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 politics at a local level and a national level uh, can engage together to uh, have outcomes that are satisfactory for the people uh, who are governed. We're just embarking on the same process in Northern Ireland. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, uh, financial capital, money, uh, manufactured capital, that stuff that is made that we all consume in one way or another, uh, social capital, the, uh, the abilities, the skills that are involved within a community, uh, human capital, uh, the individual capabilities and capacities, and then uh, natural capital, what we, uh, what we use. Um, the whole history of sustainable development, it goes back way beyond 1992, but in the Rio Earth Summit of 1992, it was formalized for the first time. And it was a global uh, uh, meeting at which leaders of many of the world states were there, and they all signed up to this, uh, these various declarations. The most substantial of those was something called Agenda 21, it was a way in which countries were going to uh, pursue their development goals into the 21st century. And it did have quite uh, far-reaching consequences. Certainly uh, in our own nations, uh, Agenda 21 was the way in which a lot of development took place towards the end of the 1990s and well into the 2000s. Um, also set at the global level were these Millennium Development Goals uh, a set of very ambitious goals geared much more towards developing countries than developed countries. And they were uh, successful uh, to some degree, but, but not nearly enough. Uh, emerging from the Rio summit was that idea of the UK committing 0.7 of its GDP to international aid, uh, something which uh, I'm glad to say is still extant and still uh, in place. Uh, and that development assistance uh, was embodied within the Millennium Development Goals and helped a lot of developing countries uh, get on, as it were. What is new is we've now got the Sustainable Development Goals that have replaced the uh, MDGs, and these are the, if you like, the current objectives at a global level uh, for sustainable development in the future. Uh, they're embodied in this agenda for 2030. That's the date by which we hope the SDGs will be delivered. Uh, 193 countries have signed up to them uh, just recently in September 2015. There are 17 goals with all of these targets and uh, actions. These are the global, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, you'll find these you know, widely. Just Google UN SDGs. Uh, this is what, what will come up. So these are the goals as they stand are for act actions and targets for all countries all around the world. But one of the things that we've done in the UK is we've had a look and we've said, right, which of these are the most applicable for us? What can we do that is going to be uh, uh, the most beneficial globally? 
and we've reprioritized uh, the goals for the UK. Um, what we've finished up with is goal 13, tackling climate change, um, has been deemed to be uh, the goal that is of most relevance to the UK, uh, along with goal 7, clean energy, and goal 12, responsible consumption. Um, and the Scottish Government has already uh, confirmed its uh, adoption and implementation of the SDGs uh, and working to achieve those by 2030. Uh, that's in the Scotland's Programme for Government 2015-16. Uh, As I say, you'll find those, uh, a, a map of the SDGs uh, widely on the net. Uh, this is what happened in Scotland. Um, the 2005 strategy, uh, Choosing Our Future, widely thought of as probably the best strategy in the UK. Uh, the UK national strategy for the whole of the nation uh, was very good, uh, but a lot of people thought this was a much better uh, uh, attempt at trying to capture and deliver on sustainable development goals. Uh, we certainly in Northern Ireland looked very strongly to the Scottish uh, model whenever we were drafting our own sustainable development strategy at home. Um, following on from that, you emerged into this uh, wonderful idea of the national performance outcomes where the national goals were married to the local goals uh, in this common framework of trying to uh, get there without departments. You know, I still admire that. Uh, I don't know if it's working very well or not, but you know, from where I sit, it looks good. Uh, we've now uh, adopted a version of these outcomes. In fact, we're consulting on it right now. The newest program for government is taking these long-term uh, 30, 40, 50 year outcomes, uh, 14 of them. Uh, again, hard to disagree with any of the objectives. Uh, the, the, the detail uh, in how the delivery will take place will be very, very interesting. Right now, we're just consulting on the outcomes themselves. But it's a direct result of what has happened in Scotland. Uh, so I think, you know, the government here can take a bow uh, that uh, a government in another place is looking with envy, uh, thinking that it seems to be working pretty well over here and, uh, and copying the idea. Um, and also thanks to work done by the Carnegie Trust based in Scotland, but uh, having done a lot of very good work in Northern Ireland. And in terms of trying to look at sustainable development in your phase two application, you know, have a look at the well-being work that's been done by the Carnegie Trust uh, in Scotland. Uh, you'll find lots of inspirational stuff in there, I hope. Uh, so the sort of uh, uh, thing that this outcome-based accountability lends itself towards is to look at each outcome of government and uh, think how they, uh, how that can be implemented. So for reducing the impact, um, reducing the impact of uh, 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 consumption, for example, you can have a cutting of the carbon footprint. It's a phrase I'm sure you're familiar with, using less energy, using less carbon intensive energy. Um, cutting the generation of waste and increasing the amount of renewable energy. Those are the sorts of targets that are put in in order to uh, uh, cut the impact of consumption. The low carbon economy, something which has been very successful in Scotland, renewables, you've got a lot of renewable resource in Scotland and uh, the way it's been uh, uh, harnessed uh, has been uh, very successful. And uh, at the local level, uh, uh, initiatives like the Local Energy Challenge Fund, um, Orkney, for example, got 1.3 million for a tidal and wind turbine project emerging from Scottish government's own funds. And another fund you've put in place here, uh, the Climate Challenge Fund for smaller scale projects. And that's established stuff like closed loop recycling uh, on call uh, or uh, a bike workshop and cafe in Inverness. You know, these are small community based projects, but all of that coming together is the sort of uh, intervention by uh, national governments uh, that we think are, are, are well worthwhile and follow the themes of sustainability.
Now, in terms of this program, um, sustainability is one of these horizontal principles cutting across uh, all of the interreg and indeed in uh, Ireland and the, uh, Northern Ireland and the border counties, the peace program as well. So whatever the nature of your project application, it has to take account of uh, the requirements of environmental protection. So it must be compliant with the law. And uh, as is always the case with the law, ignorance is no excuse. Uh, make sure that you are compliant uh, with legislation. Um, it's going to look at resource efficiency. Uh, you'll be thinking about the supply chain. I'll talk a good bit more about this later on. And climate change. Um, it wants you to take mitigating action as far as you can. In other words, what can you do within your project that's going to not contribute to adverse climate change? Or uh, possibly more pertinent these days to recognize the need for adaptation. Climate change is going to happen. It is happening. And uh, you therefore need to think about uh, adaptation. In the previous uh, Interreg program, one of the projects called Sail West a marine tourism project covering Northern Ireland, uh, the west of Ireland, Sligo and the west coast of uh, Ireland and the west coast of Scotland. Uh, and that was uh, actively putting new marinas in place. And the project, uh, both in its application and in its delivery, took account of climate change when it was designing these new marinas, took account of the future uh, sea level rise that is predicted. So, you know, that's a good example of a capital development that uh, adopted uh, climate change thinking and uh, adapted to that climate change of the future. And uh, disaster resilience, creating the capacity within your uh, uh, project, again, to withstand floods, storms. One of the uh, projects at home uh, near me, uh, something called the Gobbins, a wonderful new tourist attraction, uh, building on something that was started in Victorian times. The access to this coastal walk is down a very steep hill and they put in, it was a six million pound project, <clears throat> and they put in all these new access steps to get down to the coastal walk. Coastal walks, it is fantastic and it's wonderful stainless steel engineering to get across chasms and bridges. The uh, steps down to the uh, uh, attraction were a bit more crude, they were basically steps with recycled material filled with uh, gravel. And there was a big storm at the start of the year, Storm Frank, you may recall, the first few days of, the, of 2016. And the steps were like, they were just literally just washed away. The first storm, this attraction only opened in August last year. First big test, boom, gone. Uh, and that's the sort of disaster resilience that uh, wasn't built in. I'm not suggesting that you know, they might have known better or that maybe it should have been more storm proof, but six million quid uh, and nobody could get to the attraction uh, after Storm Frank. It has subsequently been uh, reinstated, but they've got rid of the steps and they've just put in a, uh, a, a walkway over the grass, basically. So works for me. Um, and risk prevention and management is the other uh, element to be considered there. Sorry. So for each of these uh, applications, um, you've got to pr provide evidence of your horizontal principle of sustainable development. Uh, this iteration of Interreg is different from previous rounds for those of you who've had advantage <coughs> from Interreg before. Um, the project themes are quite specific and there are very defined outputs for each uh, of those elements of the fund. The overall program has been subjected to an environmental assessment. Uh, this is just the non-technical summary, but it went through a, you know, a fairly substantial uh, environmental assessment to make sure the overall program uh, was compliant. Um, but you've got to demonstrate that your own project uh, is uh, compliant and that it contributes positively to sustainability. And here's the rub. Uh, you've got 100 marks available for the whole assessment only five of them are for sustainability, but you've got to score at least three. If you don't score three, scrubbed. 
Uh, so you need to demonstrate that you're contributing positively to sustainability in the overall uh, uh, project application. And that's what we're going to try and help you to do today. Um, there are inherently unsustainable projects. So, for example, you might be a manufacturer of a, a gold-plated sports car that parks itself outside Harrods. Uh, it's not a very sustainable uh, objective. And yet, if you're the manufacturer, you might be able to say, but I'm doing it very sustainably because I'm not wasting any of that gold leaf. Uh, it's all reclaimed and put onto the next car. Uh, so, you know, that is an aspect of sustainability. Um, and by contrast, you might have a, a project which is fundamentally sustainable. You may be building a cycle path uh, as, a, as a tourist attraction in, uh, I don't know, the Trossachs or wherever. Uh, but to do that, you may decide that you want to cut down a native forest or a great tract of native forest and that you bring in gravel from China in order to build your cycle path. Well, you know, that's not terribly sustainable. So a sustainable project uh, delivered unsustainably um, is no more satisfactory than, well, it's a bit more satisfactory than the gold-plated sports car. Uh, what you've got to do is to uh, show that you intend to deliver your project uh, in a way that's uh, uh, helpful to sustainability. So as I say, the, uh, uh, the overall program's been subjected to a rigorous uh, strategic environmental assessment, and it is possible that your individual project may require uh, an environmental impact assessment. Uh, Sarah knows a bit more about that uh, at the individual requirements of SEUPB, and if you're involved uh, in a project that requires planning permission, there is very clear guidance in Northern Ireland at least, and I'm sure in Scotland too, on what will trigger the need for an individual environmental impact assessment on your project. I see a nod at the back there. Um, so the incorporation of the principle of sustainable development is what the meat of my presentation is about, and we'll do that now. You've got with you a tool I've provided you with the sustainability assessment tool that uh, we've designed. Um, the, the tool itself was specifically designed for council use in Northern Ireland. Uh, our councils across the water have uh, a limited suite of responsibilities, rather less than councils uh, in Great Britain. Uh, and the, the tool was originally designed around their needs. Now we have subsequently uh, tweaked that, uh, amended it, and made it uh, applicable for use by organizations beyond councils. And that's the model that you're gonna be using uh, 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 today. Uh, a council or an organization can use this SAT for uh, a project, for a policy, for a strategy, uh, even for an event. Um, and at the same time, it can't by itself meet every eventuality uh, for projects that you'll be pursuing under Interreg. So you've got to use um, a large dollop of uh, common sense when, uh, when applying uh, uh, the criteria that you're going to see in this SAT. But it will help you to think about your proposal uh, and about how it will meet the horizontal principles. Basically, that means that for your project, you've got to determine, will it support or at least not prevent economic development? Will it encourage or at least not prevent social well-being? And will it, at the same time, enhance or at least not damage uh, the environmental quality of the land that you're uh, 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 going to use for the project? Those are the you know, top three criteria uh, in, um, in sustainable development. It has to, your project, well, you have to demonstrate how you are incorporating sustainable development thinking, and you need to consider what will be the long-term impact of the work that we'll undertake in our project. 
If you can do that, then your quid's in. But the questions on the SAT, they are a guide. They're there to provoke your thinking around sustainability. Uh, they're not a straitjacket. So plainly, uh, a project that might be uh, developing a cross-border greenway, for example, has to consider many aspects of environmental sustainability, but might have to work harder to incorporate thinking on safer communities. And you know, I'm thinking here about the health projects. Uh, it might be rather uh, simpler for you to demonstrate the horizontal principle of equality than it is to demonstrate sustainability. Uh, and there'll be those uh, that have the reverse situation. If you've got something which is broadly environmental, you can probably uh, 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 demonstrate sustainability, and it's harder, perhaps, to uh, demonstrate equality. But you need to think about how you're going to demonstrate economic, social, and environmental criteria uh, in the, I think it's 500 words you've got to demonstrate uh, your contribution to sustainable development. There are some other maxims that I think I'd like to unpack right at the start. And uh, one of those is that sustainable development is about people. It's not a tree hugger's charter. It's not only about the environment. And it's one of the bugbears of my professional life is that whenever you start to talk about sustainable development, there's an automatic assumption that you're a tree hugger, that you're going to be wearing sandals, you'll have a beard, and uh, you don't know what a suit looks like. And you, know, you do have to uh, try and uh, disarm those senior civil servants with whom one occasionally has to meet uh, in that way um, and, and get rid of that wrong assumption right at the start. Sustainable development is a people-centered idea. Um, the other wonderful question I think uh, that needs to be asked is, who'll be better off? Will anybody be better off as a result of your project? And the answer really should be yes. If it isn't going to be yes, there ain't much point in doing it. Somebody should be better off. A lot of people should be better off as a result of your work. Is there public benefit rather than private gain? It's a non sequitur. Public benefit should be the objective of your project, and I'm sure it will be. Um, and then the laws of unintended consequences. Certainly in the world of the environment, uh, people are all too familiar with the laws of unintended consequences. The people who brought the rabbit to Australia uh, as food uh, and devastated half of the natural habitat of a, of a continent. Um, end of year budget spend is one that I always think is unintended consequences. People plan to deliver all these things in their departmental budgets and they get to February and they're frantically offloading DOSH. Uh, NGOs like mine benefit from that, but uh, it's the law of unintended consequences in a good way. Also known as Murphy's Law, I think. Right. Okay, on to the, uh, 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 the questions themselves. So you've got 15 sections in the uh, sustainability assessment tool. And yeah, I think what I'd like to do at this point is to get you to do the legwork and uh, to think about how, um, how your project or your projects will, uh, 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 will address many of these issues. And we'll scoot through uh, each of them in turn. Um, starting with economic development. Considering how proposals can offer education, training, facilities, and the development of new skills. That isn't the first one. Sorry, economic development is the first one. How can your proposal support the use of local business services or products? Uh, and here, of course, yes, indeed. I'm just, I'm, I'm going to unpack this, going to unpack this. Yeah, there are procurement rules, absolutely. Of course there are. Um, and you have to work within those procurement rules. Um, but there are interventions that can be done. And you can't specify a local supplier under European regulation uh, for a certain level. But there are lots of ways in which um, creativity can be brought to bear on uh, procurement processes. And, you know, in sustainability terms, if you can 
uh, give preference to local organizations, then uh, within the rules where it's possible, then that's a sustainable development uh, input. Um, one of the best examples of that uh, that is widely used is the idea of providing fresh food. Uh, you can't specify that the food must be locally grown, but you can specify that it must be fresh. And it's very difficult for a supplier in Spain to provide you with defined fresh food uh, for, for a project under procurement rules. Perfectly legitimate thing to do. Um, you know, I don't know, again, I don't know over here, but in Northern Ireland, there is some really good guidance on sustainable procurement. Uh, and in Scotland, uh, you know, I have seen some guidance here as well about how to go about uh, 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 procuring sustainably within the rules. Uh, yes? Yeah, that's best value principles there. Uh, best value does not mean lowest price. You know, again, in, in real life, you are going to run up against barriers in that regard. Um, but best value does not mean lowest price. Did it? So this is all publicly available information, and that's on the sustainable procurement part of the uh, websites. Uh, you know, that's that's where you go. That's that's where you you look at. Follow up there. Yeah. So that's obviously the marketing. Just say that again. I didn't hear that last bit. Yeah. And, you know, in that context then, um, you know, meeting the buyer events uh, may be appropriate for your project. Collaborative supply chain issues may be appropriate for your project. Um, certainly, um, small organizations, SMEs, are often put off uh, by the tender process. Um, again, from personal experience, uh, organizations who are tendering to supply uh, into the very complex system of catering uh, supply within the uh, uh, Northern Ireland Health Service. Um, a lot of small organizations won't touch it with a barge pole. They perceive that it's too big for them. And in fact, the, uh, uh, the health trusts go out of their way to try and get collaborative uh, uh, ventures uh, uh, by getting a lot of small players to come together to supply to the health service. So. It's initiatives like that which, where you as the, as the procurement agency are, are taking the initiative. And you know, if you're the guy with the checkbook, you've got a lot of power. Uh, but uh, there is that uh, guidance. I'm, I, it's been changed last week, but you've got uh, the sustainable procurement duty uh, suggests that you should consider how in conducting the procurement process it can improve the economic, social and environmental well-being of the authorities area. How it can facilitate the involvement of small and medium-sized enterprises, third sector bodies and supported businesses in the process and promote innovation. You know, that's in the legislation for Scotland. So, how it's carried out is what the guidance will be about. I'm grateful to you for pointing that out. Thank you. The area is infrastructure improvement or facilities to support sustainable development. How many of the projects, as you understand them at the moment, how many of your projects may involve capital expenditure, build infrastructural investment? Just one. Okay. Um, well, I'll not labor the point then, but if there is any construction involved, you need to be looking to uh, externally accredited standards to make sure that it's going to be a sustainable build, whether that's uh, BREAM or 
uh, LEED or any of the other uh, external accreditation. Uh, stuff that I've seen over here that's useful, the Highlands and Islands Enterprise Guidance Manual for Construction. Uh, there's something uh, funded by the last Interreg, the Smart Eco Hub Sustainable Building Guide, uh, Northern Ireland and Republic, uh, the border counties, uh, good bit of work. It's an area that provides real opportunities for excellence. In that same field, can you encourage a reduction in travel? Can you use community transport or public transport instead of using private cars as the default mode of transport? Can you make better use of ICT technology uh, or community IT assets? And thirdly there, how can your proposal support a low carbon development approach? Can you support or encourage the use of renewable energy? Yes. Well, I think at this stage, you know, you're in the application phase. You, uh, you've, got to, you've got to want to be doing it in the first place. Uh, and I think the audit trail, it's not an area where I, I don't know how the SEEPB works this. I don't work for them. Um, who, uh, you, people have had interreg money before here. What about the answer to that question? How does the audit trail go back on your original proposal? Yeah. 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 Uh, again, I think at this stage it is about intention. Uh, but plainly, one doesn't want to work a fiction going in here and uh, with no intention of carrying through. <laughs> yeah. But let's ask Sarah that question when she comes back in. I'll just make a note of that. Yeah, but we, we'll, we'll pick that up with Sarah when she comes back in. <coughs> uh, low carbon approach, uh, renewable energy, energy efficiencies. Uh, you may be developing sustainable tourism initiatives and there's plenty of, uh, uh, plenty of good information on green tourism uh, on, uh, on a, a website called Green Tourism. Uh, tourism NI also has good guidelines on sustainability in that area. And uh, sustainable business practices, uh, ethical improvements, energy reduction, uh, waste reduction, and active travel options. Active travel, the whole idea of walking and cycling um, wherever possible. Um, education and training, um, how can your proposal offer opportunities for education training and the development of new skills among your stakeholders? Um, some good examples, uh, a council in Northern Ireland uh, ran under Interreg last time a restore project which provided uh, NVQ qualifications for uh, uh, 
people who are unemployed in the whole business of furniture repair and restoration. Uh, indirect learning, uh, that Gobbins project I mentioned earlier on, uh, has employed 40 or 50 local guides all on a part-time basis who are delivering the uh, local history experience to tourists. Uh, so um, their, their local knowledge uh, being enhanced. Um, same applies to local environmental issues on community knowledge. And building the confidence of, uh, uh, of local communities. There's a lot of very successful community gardening projects have been incorporated uh, around Scotland. All uh, worthwhile sustainable development initiatives. Placement projects. Uh, perhaps some of the universities here uh, have a need for placements. Uh, bring them into your project if you can. Um, how can your proposal provide practical examples of good practice uh, from which others can learn? There's a uh, wonderful uh, expression from a colleague of mine. He always says, good practice is a bad traveler. And uh, uh, it's something which we uh, too often don't look closely enough at, where there are exemplars of good practice. Uh, don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, copy it. Uh, but in the case of your own project, how are you going to communicate your successes to others? Um, can you put your case studies on your own website if you have one? Can you put it on others' websites? Award schemes. Uh, the Scottish Green Apple Awards are uh, uh, fairly high profile. Um, Green Tourism Awards. Uh, the RSPB's uh, own Nature Awards. Uh, a useful way to promote uh, the appropriate project if that's appropriate to your project. And offering study tour visits. Uh, those who do go out and look at other examples of good practice, uh, put yourself out there uh, a, 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 as a destination. Good practice starts uh, with you. Social media, uh, something that certain parts of society aren't yet that comfortable with, a lot of public sector organisations don't yet use social media, but it's a damn good way to promote uh, your own good work. Uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, obviously, uh, lots of others. And, uh, you know, using those social media to tell the story as it's developing, not waiting to the end and saying, look at us, we're brilliant, uh, but to, uh, to do it as you go along. And I think insisting on excellence, um, in the delivery of your project, no matter what it is, uh, to make sure that from the outset you do have a high standard uh, of expectation. Uh, the third element is innovation and job creation. Um, how can your proposal provide local employment opportunities? Social clauses within those procurement contracts. Uh, community engagement, someone mentioned in the new Scottish guidance. Uh, that's that's what's there, community benefit in procurement. Uh, there is uh, information, guidance uh, in Public Contract Scotland on facilitating SMEs in the procurement process, back to what we said earlier. And using local labour where it's possible to do so. How can your proposal foster innovation or research uh, in developing the area's strengths? Um, links with universities. Um, we have a program at home, Invest NI, the Economic Development Unit, offers relatively small grants that they call innovation vouchers. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a wonderful example of uh, an art and design team who were asked to try and make flak jackets more suitable for uh, uh, the feminine figure. And using one of those innovation vouchers, uh, this girl went off and redesigned the standard flak jacket issued to uh, the PSNI in, uh, in Northern Ireland. And, uh, and it's now been taken up and it's what's used as the, as the standard default for the design for women wearing flak jackets. Uh, all coming out of a £3,000 voucher. There's bound to be something similar here. Um, building on uh, traditional skills, um, the European Regional Development Fund has something called the, the Northern Periphery Programme and there they have something uh, a project called Economuse, which showcases traditional trades to visitors. Uh, the Causeway Coast and Glens in Northern Ireland is part of the Economuse area. The nearest one to here is the Faroe Islands. 
but there at home we've got a um, manufacturer who makes uh, hurdy sticks uh, out of ash, uh, uh, scullion hurdles, and you, know, you can go and watch the guys at work making these hurdles. Uh, another one is uh, Broiter Gold, where they make uh, high-value ripseed oil from what used to be uh, just for cattle feed, and they've made a very su successful business out of, uh, out of that. Uh, in the Faroe Islands, they have traditional boat builders uh, and traditional musicians are part of that same Oconomuse uh, uh, trade. Another Interreg 4A project uh, was Trade Links, and by the end of their implementation phase, they'd supported 580 small companies, mostly micro businesses, created over 250 new jobs, and helped to secure over 1,200 more jobs in that uh, border region of Northern Ireland, Ireland. And finally, can your project support and encourage the development of social enterprise? There's a huge sector for social enterprise in Scotland. Um, you've got over 5,000 different social enterprises here, 200 new ones starting up every year. 112,000 employees, 3.86 billion uh, net worth, according to uh, a 2015 report uh, censusing the social enterprise sector. 22% of them are in the Highlands and Islands, such as COPE uh, in Shetland, employing adults with disabilities, the Kalman Trust in the Highlands, supporting young people into independent living, and one dear to my own heart, the Northern Ireland uh, Community Energy, where uh, the organisation is basically putting uh, PVs, solar PVs, onto community buildings uh, and uh, reinvesting uh, the the income from the solar energy back into other community uh, buildings. The community organizations themselves don't pay for the installation. So it's a virtuous circle. Um, we're going to take a break uh, about now, 10 minutes, and uh, we'll come back and have a look at some more uh, after that. Okay, folks, going to make a start again. Just before we kick off again, Sarah's just going to address that question around um, audit. Well, basically, by putting this in your application, your business plan, it's, it's, it's very different from the last program. The last program, it wasn't very heavily scored. So if you, um, if you shone through in all other aspects of your application, but your horizontal principles was a bit weak, you tended to get through anyway. This time round, we've basically put scores in where you have to score a minimum of three to get through, and I'm sure you all know that anyway. In terms of auditing, we have a requirement uh, by the Commission. We submit every year what's called the Annual Implementation Report to the Commission. Um, the first year, which has just been submitted, was considered a light report, so it was just sort of, where, where are you going with your programme at this stage, very early stages? Next year will be what's called the heavy report, and we have um, a section in that to write up on how our programmes are contributing to the horizontal principles, so against the regulations. So we will be seeking information from projects. Now, we're still developing our progress report template. It's nearly finished. I don't anticipate, and it's not anticipated, that we will be asking you every time you submit a progress report to report on equality or sustainable development but we will certainly be asking you at least once a year to provide us with how you're implementing what you promised within your business plan. Yes. For our yes. Some of them are things that we would simply say, by doing this project, we would certainly be contributing towards that ambition or this ambition. And I, I guess what I'm looking for is a guide on do, should you simply stick to the two that apply rather than the 15 that potentially you could claim to be contributing towards 
so that you've got something that's make, you know, make a measurable programme? Yes, I, th I think certainly that would be a lot more focused. We don't want war and peace, and we certainly, in this round of programmes, are trying to reduce the burden on you guys to provide us with long essays on, on different aspects of your implementation. So, yes, if you say in your business plan you have definite measurable outputs relating to the horizontal principles, report on those. It's really up to you whether you want to provide any additional and say, well, actually, you know, in our business plan, we didn't anticipate we would actually do this, but now we're doing it, and that's always very credible and very, you know, that extra piece of information will go to the commission. So I would tend to stay with what you put in your business plan, and if it's measurable, even better. But the, 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 the additional benefits, whether it's quality or sustainable development, that have happened along the way, please report because it's, you know, it's really good to see that even though you may not have anticipated that you're going to contribute in certain ways, you're doing it. But again, focused, not, you know, we're, we're trying not to have these long progress reports where you're really, you know, it, it's a lot of ad administration work for you guys when you just want to get your projects implemented. Can I just follow that question about, so, so say you're saying Is this your outputs, or are we, are we talking about the horizontal yeah, principles? Yes. We, we, will, we will be looking for evidence for the programme outputs, mm -hmm. so the, the formal performance framework. Mm -hmm. We will be looking for evidence and, and they will be audited at times mm -hmm. for that. That's not a formal programme output, what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we won't be coming and saying, show us yeah. whatever. You just want us to report their contribution towards it? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. I mean, it strikes me that in the case of public sector organisations, you are likely to have more exacting uh, measurables against targets uh, for other dimensions of your work than SEUPB is going to impose upon you. I think you're looking at light touch here. Is that fair, Sarah? Yes. Yes. Sorry if these questions are just because I'm involved in other projects as well. Not a problem. Yes. That, that, that's what we're here for, yeah, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Ask anything you want. Absolutely. I'll try and answer. Okay, I'm, I'm conscious that I've slipped badly behind time here. I'm going to scoot through these last two bits of economic, and then I, 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 what I'd like to do is to have a quick look at the framework of the tool and see at your tables how it's going to work for you and ask any questions um, that we can help you with. Um, so two more slides, and then we'll quickly go on to a, a group session. Um, okay, um, proposals that link production and local consumption an example of that, Zero Waste Scotland um, has been working with people in fashion design to, to minimise the waste of textiles. Um, local provenance, retailers are very fond of promoting their use of local produce uh, with the understanding that people actually like to buy stuff that's got a, a local provenance. Farmers markets um, have been very successful in uh, various parts of Northern Ireland and Scotland. Uh, Nourish Scotland a terrific little organisation working to promote local seasonal uh, and healthy food. Um, how will your proposal be of benefit to local businesses? Again, we've covered that largely uh, already, uh, but can you work alongside uh, social organisations, NGOs? Uh, and the last one, uh, the implementation of your proposal demonstrating best value. Uh, where I come from, best value is quite uh, carefully defined. Um, the most advantageous combination of cost, quality and sustainability that meets customer requirements. And cost there means a consideration of the whole life cost of the uh, procurement, not merely the lowest price. Quality means a specification that's fit for purpose and sufficient to meet your customer's requirements. And sustainability, well, the economic, the social and the environmental benefits uh, to be considered in the business case for procurement. 
Sure. If you are the social enterprise. I don't think it needs to be any added value. It is. I think you're demonstrating. No, it's not because the feedback we get from tenders is um, if we're successful, but we always, like most employees, for example, are looking for more. So it's almost like, yeah, you do that already, so what else are you going to do? And it's, it's Seems it's perverse. Moving, yeah, it moves away from it that if you're getting, for example, your organisation is getting hundreds of local authorities to run a training programme, then if you're filling the needs in, you'd be looking for more than that. But that, because that's what they're paying you for anyway. Sure. So but surely you're satisfying the criteria that are being asked for. You think so, but that's not the way well, I mean, I'm sorry, but I, in the case of this, and I don't want to, yeah. you know, say what local authorities are doing, but in the case of this, if you're satisfying the criteria that, you know, if you're, if the ordinary work that you're doing demonstrates a contribution to social well-being, environmental protection, and economic benefit, they should do it. absolutely, you're demonstrating a contribution to sustainable development as a horizontal principle within this. Application. I, I think that's that that satisfies the criteria. Right, right. Yeah. Well, it's a, you know it's an interesting it's an interesting idea. The fact that you're doing everything that's required and somebody says, well, can you not do more? You have to do that. Yeah. But you know, if but if you were to go back to the building metaphor, then if your organisation was to be establishing a building, nobody says you have to make that building sustainable. Yeah, that's what I mean. But you are going to do it. Yeah. If. Yeah. But but. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Okay. With you. But, but you as a social enterprise might engage in the building of a building. Yeah. You might commission somebody to build the building. As the client, you're saying, right, this building has to be sustainable. Yeah. The builder may not wish to do that until you tell them so. Yeah. <laughs> um, investment for sustainability. Um, Well, the match funding, uh, I guess, you know, you've sort of secured that if you're here today or you're going to be able to secure it. Uh, so that aspect should be covered. Long-term economic investment for your area. Um, good example, again, from where I come from myself, a smart energy program, which is using renewables with small and medium-sized enterprises and looking at smart grid development. That's a good example of uh, long-term economic investment. Um, another project at home, uh, Ulster University uh, in last interreg uh, funding did a project on energy storage and uh, the Crest Centre in Inniskillen worked with 150 SMEs in Ireland and Scotland uh, taking advantage of renewable energies. And uh, another example, uh, a science park uh, established in the northwest of uh, Northern Ireland in Derry uh, drew its inspiration and uh, the experience of a, a similar project in Belfast. Interreg funded again. Uh, and then the implications of long-term costs, that story I told earlier on about the Gobbins project, uh, a good example of how uh, unexpected costs uh, occurred after the project was complete. Uh, be aware that it can happen. Okay, look, that's the economic uh, element uh, complete. Can I ask you just to have a look uh, at your tables in discussion with each other and have a look at the uh, five elements that we've got there, the five economic elements, and see if you can, um, see if you think that your project's going in the right direction to satisfy those criteria. And uh, see if you can come up with any queries or points that might be of benefit to your colleagues uh, around the room. Uh, do that for about five minutes, please.
And I'm going to be a bit of feedback here and see if we've got any uh, cross-fertilization of ideas. Anybody? No, I mean, I think that's exactly right. It, it, the, the reason that we designed this uh, tool was for um, colleagues within a council uh, uh, at home to be able to demonstrate that they are contributing to sustainability because most of the times they aren't aware that they are doing so. Uh, so it's a, it's a tool to try and um, support rather than uh, cross-question. And it is not necessary to go through and take every single uh, 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 some criterion within this uh, form. That's not the purpose. It's to, it's to encourage the proper direction of travel. Now, you know, you're also right, let's not be complacent about it either. You know, be realistic about it. But on the whole, when public money is being spell, spell, spent by public sector bodies or by third sector bodies with public benefit in mind, then you are likely to be in the correct direction of travel. I mean, I think there's a big contrast with uh, a private sector organization whose principal beneficiary is the shareholders of that company or the owners, the individuals who run that company. Then there's a different philosophy at play. And, uh, you know, the environment, for the sake of argument, may come a poor second uh, if there's profit to be made uh, as a new building is erected. Or um, a, a group of people in, within a community may have to go hang if uh, there is a road to be driven through. You know, I'm, those are crass examples, but you get the drift. Um, so I think that's a good point, and thank you for making it. Any other points that might be uh, beneficial? Yeah, like, uh, I've been a good um, tool which allows you to work through systematically. But it was okay not to be scoring yourself yeah. with the length and everything. I yeah. think that was the point of came. Every project is so very different. Yeah. Uh, but I think red flags would have to go up if, if every um, kind of rail, not the, none of the relevant ones were to yeah. it should be yeah. a red flag to see yeah. actually we have a case yeah. for this. And, yeah. and in, that, in that case, you know, it's still not the end of the world, as it were, because you can say, right, well, what can I do to mitigate against some of these places where I've got a bit of an X there? Uh, you know, and you're not submitting these forms to the SEUPB as part of your application. You know, you're using that to help you to fill in the relevant box in the application form. Uh, but yes, if it flags something to you within your project, you might, I hope, have cause for thought to say, right, well, what can I do to make my project a bit more beneficial economically, socially, or environmentally? And the other point that came up was that if um, the outputs of the the part of the programme that you were applying to had certain uh, targets, and those targets were reflected in some of these boxes, yeah. then you've got a problem. Right, okay. You had a point, sir, uh, around the uh, monitoring of progress. Yeah, it's obviously, you know, sort of uh, the previous structural funds programmes, as most of you will be aware, you know, sort of 
sustainable development was within there. And you know, the tick box of you know, the starting bin in the corner of the office was sufficient to get you through. Um, you know, the Scottish Government and the Structural Funds Division in particular got a hammering from our Sales and Seabrook Commission to report after the last programming period on those grounds. Um, across all structural funds, including Interreg, you know, these whole principles are being more enforced than everything else. So even though there's no financial penalties per se, there is a reputational risk and it will be monitored. And the way that you know, SUPB has carefully structured its monitoring committees and its steering committees is that you do have the likes of myself and Sebra and others on those who will question whether you're delivering against your, your horizontal theme. We will be there and sort of quizzing you and everything else. And we will ask questions and they will come back and tell you to improve and things like that. So even though the bottom line is there won't be financial penalties this time, you know, reputationally, if you want to apply for funds in the future and you haven't delivered against what you promised, that will be, a, you know, be held against you. So you need to keep it in mind. I think, you know, sort of, some valid points here, you know, sort of the key with, with this and the whole point of this training and everything else is to, to get you thinking. You know, if everybody just thinks about the things and goes through and says, oh, but we've been doing it like that, that's not quite how we should be doing it. That's what we're after. It's like anything else, you know, it's not the enforcement of it, it's the getting you to think about it and sort of implement where you can. It's yeah, and it's, it's trying to get those principles adopted from the outset not as some bolt on later on because you've got to meet whatever, a report, but to try and get you to think about the benefits uh, that we've constantly described, social, environmental and economic, from the outset as you design the overall uh, programme. In the project design phase, get those things uh, into your head. That's the idea. Earlier. Well, the SEPB might want to buy it from me for an issue. <laughs> <laughs> They've got it now. <laughs> <laughs> I think there is a, a general concern, though, that how we go ahead and we go based on the information of, of maybe not as much information as we've got, and we set ourselves baselines and results, and maybe come in and we look at them, and we actually haven't done it right, because some guidance has been set up from the centre of the programme. You know, I think people are looking I mean, we're looking at what we've got to do, but we're looking for some assurances from the Commission or Scottish Government that if you're going to monitor it, we need to know exactly what's going on with it so we know what to capture. Sure, sure. Um, Where do you think that might come from, usefully? Well, I keep going back to baseline information. If we've got the public service has baseline information, particularly for climate change, I keep repeating this myself, I say this all the time, um, it's an ongoing conversation. But You've got the baseline information the for baseline information the climate parameter. So if you, if you write a project application, so you're going to do X, Y, and Z, you need to be able to measure the contribution towards that particular part of the climate change part for contribution. Yeah, yeah. But people won't want to commit themselves to that because once you've written it down, and then the Scottish Government want to look at it, yeah. they haven't done it right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a bit of a carry, I suppose, in some sense, because yeah. they've money to back off of. Well, I mean, you know, measurable targets are, uh, they're terribly useful in, yeah. in, in terms of trying to get people to do things as they should be done. But they're not always uh, that easy to, to make. And, you know, particularly with something as, uh, uh, you know, with climate change itself, you can say that you're going to have X units of energy generated from renewables in the next phase. You know, that might be uh, doable. But, you know, who's going to make sure that we stay under two degrees C of rise? So measurable targets, where they are realistic, are, are a great thing to put in. But God, they're not the end of the, you know they're not the be all and the end all of social progress. Any other points before we move on to environment, uh, uh, social uh, parameters? I'm not going to go through these. I mean, we're we're slipping too far behind time. Can I suggest that what we do next is go to the next page, the social uh, dimension, and do what you've just done. Um, have a chat around the table, around the. On this, oh, sorry, on this sheet, um, the second section, the assessment of 
social sustainability. Have a look at some of the criteria in here, and I'll pick up some examples uh, after you've had a chat among yourselves for five, ten minutes. And I'll go around the tables as we, uh, as we discuss them. <laughs> Pick up then. Um, can I pick up any points that have arisen from consideration of the social sustainability criteria? Welcome your uh, observations on that. Well, I'll, I'll chip in for start. You know, there's a lot there. Certainly on the internet, as you're probably aware, in terms of sort of uh, the education, awareness, dissemination, and everything else. There's a lot that can be built in in those respects in terms of. The, the health and well-being aspect and the social inclusion and everything else in terms of those, those links to that. Um, there's also what we were talking about is the, what we call perceptions. So people's knowledge that something is happening is a benefit in itself. You know, the example being you know, golden eagles or beavers being out there makes people feel good about their environment. So that you, you've got those sort of bits to, to fill in as well. So. Um, certainly on some of the projects you're looking at how on earth but if you think deep about it that it is there and certainly through the dissemination side there's a great opportunity to make sure that you do sort of fulfill some of these criteria so yeah talk your project up the message there anything else Question about identifying, you know, looking within your partnership as you start the project and actually working out at that early stage which partner is the most suitable to really lead on each of these criteria okay. and put the overall application and wider, wider project. And doing that early on because I think, as we said, a lot of this stuff tends to come at the end, towards the end of your application form when it's might be a bit of a rush to finish. So, but it's thinking about that as a kind of key, key driver of. Started, and how many partners might be involved in your own proposal? I mean, I'm not actually here right. on the proposal. Right. Um, but I mean, your average could be four or five partners. Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah, so in terms of delivery and, you know, who, 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 which, who'll be mostly responsible? Who'll be the senior responsible officer for, uh, for delivering against one of those measures? Anything else? Do you want to flick on to the environment then? Uh, the most tangible for some projects, uh, the least involved for some other projects, possibly the health things. Have a look through the questions there. Order for you.
one hand, um, some are going to really struggle to fill in the environmental component when their focus is almost exclusively on human health. Others are going to find this relatively easy. It's what we expected. So uh, just remember all the time that when it comes to the environment, if you cannot enhance the quality of the environment, you can at least not harm it. And I think try and draw that uh, lesson out in your proposal. Um, uh, and similarly, as we've said earlier on, about the other way around. Any points arising that, that you want to share with <coughs> colleagues around the room? <coughs> Apart from the fact that Boris isn't uh, applying to a job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any more general questions that you want to address to, I think Sarah's still around, uh, before we wrap up the sustainable development section of this morning? Well, I hope you find that uh, 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 questionnaire useful to you. Um, what I've learned this morning is that um, some applications for phase two are already in train. Others, um, people haven't heard the result of a stage one application yet. You know, I'm not privy to the timetable of how this thing works. Uh, but if you haven't yet filled a phase two application in, uh, please you know, try and use what we've uh, presented this morning as a help to, to do that. I had a question. Yeah, but then I can't get an answer. Okay. <laughs> well, look, thank you very much for your collaboration this morning. If uh, we can help my uh, organization, sustainableni.org, there's a website there with stuff on it, uh, which might be useful to you. Plenty of case studies on it, mostly generated from council, uh, brand new and, uh, and, and willing to be read. Okay. Good luck, everybody. Thanks okay. very much indeed. Okay, well, afternoon everybody. That's me, John, John Kramer. Uh, just need to nail a couple of things that Sarah said first of all before we go any further. She used that dreadful word expert. I think Michael Gove has made sure that that word will never be used ever again. <laughs> so I prefer to call myself a, a practitioner. Although I work in Northern Ireland and have lived there for 36 years now, you can probably tell by my accent I'm English originally. But I lectured at Queen's up until about two or three years ago. And I need to give the game away right from the start. I don't have any legal background whatsoever. I don't pretend to be a lawyer. I actually come from a quite different discipline. But I have worked with the equality agenda now for over, over 30 years. And something like last weekend in that context is so dispiriting. Sarah talked about the elephant in the room. When you're doing this sort of work, you simply cannot ignore an elephant like that. And purely by coincidence, when I was walking around the city centre this morning, I was stopped by a German radio crew that were interviewing people about the referendum. So I think they probably wish they hadn't asked me. Because <laughs> 10 minutes later, I was still going strong. But clearly, when you're trying to promote messages around equality and diversity, and you hope against hope that some progress is being made, you suddenly get rocked back on your heels again by something like that. So it's against this con that context that this sort of work becomes absolutely critical. So forget a almost about the criteria that you're going to be assessed against. This idea, of, and, and we're, we're surrounded by a jargon which makes an assumption that this work, sort of work is somehow straightforward. No nothing could be further from the truth. The primary objective of this afternoon is to be as pragmatic as possible 
but to provide you more than anything with food for thought. And if you want to look at any positives that come, come out, came out of the referendum, I think it would be that it actually has people, it's made people stop and think about how on earth that vote could ever have happened. The fact that we're now being asked to wear safety pins as a demonstration that we're not racist is just beyond belief. But anyway, it, it's where we are. To try to get these messages across, you, you do meet resistance. There's no question at all. And that, that, that first word there, equality, is one that often provokes the greatest resistance. And the reason why, and this is where I'll disclose my academic background, I'm actually a psychologist by training, but you hit, you hit into a fundamental emotional reaction to the word equality, and do you know why? Because everybody's perception of equality is different. Because there's a different perception of what is equal, but as well as that, it's seen as fundamentally unfair because it ignores difference. So when you, you get the people who want to hit back and talk about political correctness gone mad, they're railing against a construct which in actual fact, in psychological terms, people really do struggle with. And in Northern Ireland, I probably should put a slide up taken from the Euros, which is we're not Brazil, we're Northern Ireland. Because in terms of this whole agenda, the case law is absolutely legion. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to apologise right from the start that I will draw on a lot of that Northern Ireland case law because it's, it's what I'm doing day and daily. For example, this one, I had a formal complaint raised against me for some training work I was doing recently with the civil service because I mentioned this case. Now, unbeknown to me, there was somebody in the audience who is part of a campaign within central government, which is being organised by the Orange Order, to, re to really say that things have gone too far. The claim was that I shouldn't have been allowed to mention this case because it's still sub judice. The reality is the original decision is out there now in the public domain. And the reason why they challenged what I'd said was because, as well as talking about the case, I happened to mention that Ashes have built an extension on their works to keep up with the business that they've generated because of the publicity they've got from the case. So it was seen that I was biased against Ashes. Do you know why they call themselves Ashes in the first place, by the way? Are you all familiar with the case? No. No? no? Okay, this is the baking company where there's a guy who, Gareth, oh gosh, so his surname's gone out of my head. He worked two or three doors down from the bake bakery shop in the middle of Belfast. He went in one lunchtime and ordered this cake in support of gay marriage. Do you remember it now? Yeah, remember. There was actually a half hour program on Radio 4 devoted to it because the implications are massive. Because they accepted his order, but a few days later the owners rang him and said they couldn't fulfill the order because of their religious beliefs. And that's where the name Ashes comes in. Because Ashes is one of the 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament and they're, they're bakers. So the whole company is based on Christian beliefs. And this one will head in the direction of the Aweeda case against British Airways. She's the BA flight attendant with the crucifix who ends up going to European courts, eventually as a human rights case about freedom of expression. And she'd hooked up with a nurse with a crucifix, a marriage guidance counselor who wouldn't counsel gay couples, and the last one was a registrar who wouldn't perform civil ceremonies. And do you know what the European Court said to them? No. Well, what they said was, wise up. <laughs> In other words, you're delivering goods, facilities, and services. You're not, you don't have a right to pick and choose. B they had a side swipe at BA because they said that their dress code was too stringent for women in particular because they're, um, what's the name? They're not stewardesses, what do you call them? I can't remember. Flight attendants. Yeah, flight attendants were only allowed two shades of lipstick or a string of pearls. That was the only jewellery they were allowed. So BA, by the time the case was heard, had already had changed their dress code anyway. But this one's a fascinating case because it brings up so many issues about the provision of goods, facilities and services. 
and essentially whether you have any right to pick and choose. It's almost these are gestures of support now for the stand that they've taken. So in local maces and supermarkets, you would find Ashes products in a way that you never would have done before. So locally, lots of retailers have decided to take their products. And I was just, for the sake of fullness, I, I was just explaining that it actually hasn't harmed their business. It's actually done their business some good. Well, that's right, and that's why I just I, I wanted to talk about all angles to the story, because what you tend to get in the press is just one side of, of what's been going on. But there's a Northern Ireland case which has internationally has generated a, a huge amount of interest. It's all around the goods, facilities, and services part. I'm not here this afternoon to try and teach you about the law. I want to move beyond that fairly quickly and look at the practicalities of looking at applications and where you can move beyond compliance and look instead at ways you can actively promote equality of opportunity and good relations. But trying at the same time to leave behind this word equality, because essentially what you're dealing with instead is a much fairer construct and it's the construct of equity. And people buy into that construct in a way that they don't buy into the construct of equality. This is another word which can stymie progress because there's an assumption that mainstreaming is a bit like allowing a boat to drift along on a current because everybody's going with you. The reality of doing this work is so often you're swimming against a tide where people see that this somehow gets in the way of business, that it doesn't actually help to mesh in with the corporate objectives of an organisation. This was another famous example from Northern Ireland. The, when the RUC was transformed to the PSNI, they opened the training college at Garnerville, and within a matter of weeks, the old hands in the police started referring to it, the new training college, as PC World. In other words, political correctness gone mad, which was getting in the way of effective policing. And the reality is that these, and, and this isn't me getting up on a soapbox now, these should all work hand in glove. And hopefully by the end of the afternoon you'll see how that, that can happen. The emotional reaction to what's called inequity aversion is something that you should never ignore though. That to make progress, people have to, will only come with you if they feel that what is happening is somehow fair that people are not gaining an unfair advantage. One organisation that I spend an awful lot of time with is Sport NI. And I don't know if any of this comes over the water, any of the disputes there. Well, it's almost on a daily basis. So, for example, you take the Northern Ireland team going to the football, you immediately have a problem because what flag can you use? Because Northern Ireland doesn't have a flag. So what they adopt instead is the, what's called the Ulster Banner, which only had legitimacy up until 1972, which is the white one with the red cross and the crown in the middle, and the O'Neill hand. Am I talking in tongues now? Yeah. <laughs> which is seen as being partisan and favours one community, but there's no alternative. So how do you get out of that? Amateur boxing, a whole row over that where the minister gives over three million pounds to amateur boxing, but it has to be distributed through the governing body, which has only ever allowed Northern Irish boxers to box for Ireland. So boxers and Sandy Rowe organize a report showing how sectarian local boxing is and demand the right for their boxers to box for the UK instead of Ireland. And under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement, those people born within the borders of Northern Ireland have a right to declare their nationality as one of three things. Again, another starter for 10. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And it's the third one. It's actually written into the Good Friday Agreement. It says both. You can declare dual nationality. So our children can, but my wife and I can't because we weren't actually born with an... We can go for naturalisation, which cost an absolute fortune, but we couldn't qualify for an Irish passport, but they would. So all these things are thrown into the mix in, in Northern Ireland. The reason why I put Craig Joubert up, because I thought it would strike a note here in Scotland. <laughs> Where, this was the rugby referee who gave that awful decision against Scotland in the Rugby World Cup. <laughs> Once you deviate from fairness, that's where you get this massive emotional reaction. Lance Armstrong in cycling, just, it destroys it as a spectacle if you think you're watching something which is fundamentally unfair. And if we can get the technology to work, the reason why the two monkeys are there should become apparent in a moment. So, okay. About the well-being of somebody else, especially these are other members of their own group. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more, because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys, and uh, I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs, and with birds, and with chimpanzees. Um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, uh, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. <laughs> let, let me tell you, I, I still have two minutes left. Let me tell you a funny story about it. Those three words. Those of you like myself with children, there's, a, there's an age they hit where life changes completely. And it's the age where it moves from need to want. And it's typically when they first start to speak and they learn those three words. And tantrums and the terrible twos and all of that is attached to this thing, inequity, aversion. So when you're doing this work, you ignore this sort of, these sorts of issues at your peril because you are trying to bring people along with you. And this actually sums it up quite, quite nicely. Equality, equal treatment is unfair. Equity accommodates individual circumstance. And this is the provision of goods, facilities, and services. Access to that facility denied to people on the grounds of height. And then you start to think about what legislation is likely to kick in if you're talking about a height requirement. Or you have some sort of program and we, whatever way, way, shape, or form, there's something attaching to physicality. Which piece of legislation could potentially be invoked? 
if it's some issue attaching phys to physicality in one shape or form, any shape or form? Well, disability would be the obvious one, but there's another one that could easily be invoked and has been in a number of cases. It's gender. And it's an example of what's called indirect discrimination because on average women are shorter than men. So by having that test, what you've done is you've indirectly discriminated against women in general and against, against an individual in particular if that person can show that she is below average height as was true of somebody who wanted to join the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service, put in an application. She knew it would be turned down because she was only five foot four, and it's then a challenge of a five foot six height requirement. Suffice it to say, when it ends up in tribunal, all they can defend are physicality tests, which are job related, but they can't attach that to height. No, they did, and they reduced it. You probably noticed the police generally are much shorter than they used to be. That's actually because of Mrs. Maxwell from Carrick Fergus. <laughs> Yes, so you had to be, have a certain level of fitness to operate heavy equipment and to take the ladder off the back of a fire engine. And what you can demonstrate is... Yeah, so Sheffield Hallam University are paid a fortune by the PSNI to show that all their tests of physicality are strictly job related. There was a huge class action in America against a, fire, uh, against a police service there because they couldn't show that their physicality tests were strictly job related and they discriminated against women. Yes. That's right. And for a long time the fire service didn't have, once you were in, you were in. But now what they have is tests to show that you can continue to perform that function. And in terms of interreg, what, oh sorry, the, regula the EU regulation, what you have is the, the, the principles of the anti-discrimination legislation enshrined in these regulations. So first we have this first one, which is specifically about gender, but notice it uses the word equality. The reality is the interpretation of that will very often be an interpretation of equity and not equality, not of equal treatment, but of equitable treatment, when it actually comes through to, to case law itself. And the legislation itself, in Northern Ireland, we still have separate statutes to governing all of these. These were all done away with across England, Wales and Scotland. And the Equality Act was introduced, which then brings together all these various grounds of difference. Now, when you look at them from a practical point of view, it really is a bit of a dog's dinner. No, I realise that. Don't worry. <laughs> I said, as long as you don't look as though you're walking out in protest, then okay. <laughs> so you've got some of these which cover everybody, and you've got some which cherry-pick cherry people for special attention. So, for example, disability is one, which is restricted only to people with a disability. Um, pregnancy, maternity is another one. And we thought you also have the public sector equality duty, which has been watered down over time. We have the equivalent in Northern Ireland, which is a thing called Section 75, which is my daily work. So when you see things like the, the flags protest in Belfast, behind that would have been what's called an equality impact assessment. Now, I didn't do that particular EQIA, but I did an equivalent on the promotion of a good and harmonious environment in the city hall and its grounds. So clearly, politically, these are very sensitive issues. And there's a, the, the duty in Northern Ireland is for every designated public authority to review every policy and decision and subject it to scrutiny under Section 75. Now, in theory, the public sector duty here requires you to do the same. But to be honest, it's been 
as I mentioned before, watered down to a point where it doesn't tend to take up as much time as it used to. Is it that? Mm. Sorry. <laughs> Yes. Yes, and what I think to it, you try and be as inclusive as possible. So you may have a, you begin with a list, but you may well decide to extend that list. So whether it's something like rurality, deprivation, any of those can also be taken into consideration. What I'm uneasy about from an equity point of view is where only certain people are afforded protection. And disability is the classic example. Now, the wording of Section 75 says people with a disability and people without, which is then about requiring proportionate means of addressing special circumstances. This is written large when you look at the likes of housing associations and making adaptations to properties where they've only got a limited budget. And if they were to spend all that money on adaptations, people without a disability may suffer as a consequence. So that was going to be my question would be, if we had a person, because if we had a person in, in favour of objection, surely there's an equal and opposite objection from the other side. So and that's where, you, that's where equity kicks in, where you're trying to do something which ultimately is fair, which respects those competing rights. So you try and, through something like an equality impact assessment, so the City Hall, for example, was a reflection on the unionist traditions of the city. And visitors going around it are bombarded with flags, <laughs> basically, and memorabilia associated with that tradition. So I talked, for example, about them zoning the building. So depending upon the particular function or the corridor or the work area, there would be different standards applied. So if it's a registrar's office and you're going to have people of different tradition going there, you want it to be essentially neutral. If it's a corridor that people can walk through and you want to reflect on the history of the city, you may well retain that memorabilia, but only within that context. That's quite interesting. Is that possible? All oh, right. You can get it on the web. Get it on the web? Yeah. <laughs> and they're actually doing it now. They're starting to zone the building. Long last. With each of these, it's only when the, the lawyers get to work at it that the nuances of each of these grounds of difference start to be revealed. One of the earliest is the sex discrimination legislation, and then it waits for a T case to come along to start to test whether the law has actually been drafted to accommodate everybody. And the first case is against Cornwall County Council, ends up in the European courts. The outcome of that is the Gender Recognition Act, and I find it fascinating at the moment that you quite routinely hear people talk about LGB and T. Now, I was actually threatened by, with legal action by the T community because when I produced a document for the Equality Commission, I had the T's included with the LGB under a ground of difference, which was sexual orientation, because I had to then specify groups, and it was gay, lesbian, bisexual, heterosexual, transgendered and transsexual people, and the T community said no. And I, this was under instruction, by the way, from consultees. The T community said this is nothing to do with our orientation. This is how we define our sexual identity. So they were then moved from that and put under sex instead. And there's a lot of confusion at the moment about people's rights as they go through that journey so at the start of the journey, if you're cross-dressing, basically, but you're not doing anything to medically or biologically change, you would be transgendered. During the process of change itself, you're what's called intersexual, which is where all the problems arise. And at the end of the journey, you then um, go in front of a gender recognition panel, which has the right to reassign your sex and issue you with a new birth certificate and passport. And at that point, do you know what you become? So you've been transgendered, sexual. intersexual. No, technically you'd be called transsexual. You've crossed from one sex to the other. I haven't got time to go through each of these in great detail. Suffice it to say, each of these words have been tortured to death. Religion and belief. 
vegan won a case in the European courts claiming that that was a belief system that significantly affected their life. A feminist won a case as well. So it extends to any philosophy that you say significantly impacts on your life. We've got a, an amazing case still run, trundling on in Northern Ireland yet again. Because in Northern Ireland it's not religion and belief, it's religious belief and political opinion. And we had two guys who didn't declare on their application form for a job with the Simon community that they'd both been in prison, one for murder, the other for firearms offences. And the reason why they say they didn't have to declare their offences was because they were part of, they were politically motivated. And the terms of the Good Friday Agreement say that those crimes are now spent. And that one ended up in the House of Lords to be decided. And the interesting conclusion of the House of Lords was that there was a higher order health and safety issue which couldn't be ignored. There was a duty of care towards residents of the project and despite the, their argument theoretically was right, their criminal record couldn't be ignored. In Northern Ireland, as I mentioned, we don't have an overarching statute. There was a move for it, but it's never going to happen now. Instead, we have the separate statutes covering all of these. And we've broadly come in line with the rest of the UK. Our race relations legislation came in later. And then in the south, I'm at the moment caught in a real bind writing a document for Sport NI, which is looking at 26 and 32 county bodies and what flags they should be flying, what anthems they should be singing and all those things about representation. Because in the document, you're not allowed to refer a 26 county island to anything other than Ireland. And yet, if you want to refer to an all-island body, that also has to be referred to as Ireland. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a log jam. <laughs> so in the south, what you have are two statutes. The first one dealing with employment, and the second one dealing with goods, facilities, and services. The Equal Status Act. Covering those grounds of difference. And if you look across each of the three, you'll see there's lots of overlap, but there are also subtle differences as well. The second regulation to mention, as you can see, what it's trying to do, it's, it's trying to encompass these. Discrimination based on sex or gender, race or ethnic origin, religion or belief, disability, age or sexual orientation. And what it then goes on to specify that disability in particular should be taken into account. Just going back on the point that somebody made before, my argument in actual fact is do the lot. <laughs> do a clean sweep of ways in which people differ, including indirect discrimination that can fall under one or more of these. Religious belief can be almost... Any idea, for example, how many religions are estimated to be in Scotland? Five. How many? It is, yeah. Uh, it's about, I was told, and I can't ever verify this, about 140. Christianity alone, you're talking well over 20. All the various sects and all the various denominations all count. So again, the Northern Ireland case involves somebody who wasn't the Plymouth Brethren, who won a case against his employer, who was. A Mason won a case. Being a member of the Masonic Order can count. As a religion, yeah. Atheism is defined in law as a religion. So all of these count. Is there any philosophy that affects how you live your life? Uh, Jedi? That's right, so <laughs> <laughs> I beat you too. <laughs> um, I do have a question about that though. That just on that list there that you've got the religious belief, it goes back to the veganism thing. Yeah. That's a belief. Again, it's how that could be how that word religion is then interpreted. It, it could easily be attached to a, a, a belief as to how your lifestyle should reflect on world order and the relationship between animals. And so you would find lawyers who would love that sort of argument, to be honest. 
<laughs> I, I think this pretty much captures lots of ways in which people differ, as long as you take into account the indirect forms of discrimination which can occur as well. And once you have the lists and you've got the mechanisms for then scrutinizing, and hopefully I'll show later on as we look at some of the auditing tools, the issues then become quite obvious. But it's much more sensible to be inclusive rather than exclusive. Not, don't just stick to the boundaries of the law. Say that people differ in all sorts of ways and let's try and look at how we can accommodate those differences. Yes. Yeah. Although that, in, that word in itself can often be a turn off for people. <laughs> so rather than me then rabbiting on and making all sorts of assumptions, there's the first little exercise in. Just thought it may help to generate some discussion about what you know around all of this. I don't know if do you want to join me. Yeah. So in the handout. On page two, just very quickly, just around the table, five or ten minutes. That's it, the, the one, yeah, one with the timetable on the front. That's the one, yeah. So the answer to the first question, I'll give you a start. The one that's not given specific protection there is marital status. But it is actually written into the sex discrimination legislation that if you discriminate against somebody on grounds of marital status, that can count. Because you're then into the domain of indirect discrimination. Don't worry about agonising around all of these, it's just to give you something to talk about. Yeah. Any idea what percentage? 
percentage of those people with a disability it's estimated of engagement support are actually hit here? I've just finished a, a multi-agency consultation across Northern Ireland about disability sport. Try to look at how to move that figure up in some way. It's, it's absolutely mind-boggling the stuff that we encountered. The, the, the lack of access there was and, and the lack of engagement from people within that community. So you'd have these amazing facilities that people with a disability simply weren't using or didn't even know about. It could be couldn't or it could be wouldn't. Even the word sport, for example, was a real turn off to a lot of people with a disability. Where, where various forms of active rec recreation would have been incredibly beneficial to their health. But if it was organised within a sports setting, it was immediately it was a no no, it was a turn off. And it was trying to find ways of lowering the barriers to first of all getting people to try different sports and not just the ones that people typically associate with disability. And then beyond that, to sustain that participation and, and find ways of growing it over time. But you're starting from an incredibly low base. Number three, it's, obvious, it's all of them. But clearly, it depends whether it's part two or part three. And this is the one that we again hit up against in Northern Ireland with the relative status of Irish and Ulster Scots, where part three. The European Treaty only applies to Irish, not to Ulster Scots. And yet when they're looking for parity between the two, that's where all the arguments kick in. So Irish Irish? Yeah. they have protection? Yeah, all of them, yeah, in different ways. Ratio of Catholics to Protestants, it's about 47-53 now. And we're unique in the UK for having monitoring arrangements imposed by law. So every employer with more than nine employees has to monitor their workforce by community background. If any of you are thinking to the end of this in terms of how programs may incorporate some of this, often it's about monitoring arrangements. And you have to think long and hard about what sort of monitoring questions you really want to ask. Do you want to know if somebody is from an obscure sect or do you want to know generally what their community background may happen to be? Is it still the case though that it's particularly problematic with certain sectors? So there's a you know, project that was had in place to fit building, then you would, you would probably insist that it was monitored. Yeah. That you, you would have to be having some important um, aspect or result from the project. Yeah, for other sectors, is it, is it an issue for, for other sectors? Yeah, and it's, sometimes it's dangerous to make an assumption. So you, what, what you would typically do is when you're de developing a monitoring strategy, you begin with a list like this and you'd say, well, which are the ones where we, do we feel that there, there is a need to monitor in the first place and where there may be issues that we can't just make an assumption about? It doesn't mean you do them all. But often it's about being quite imaginative about how you develop a strategy and how, then how you implement it. So, for example, how do you go about gathering that monitoring information? Do you want to impose a further burden on the people who access your services, say? Or do you have it built into the stage where they first engage with you so they actually don't even know that they've been monitored? And those are typically the most effective ways of gathering that sort of information rather than going around with another clipboard. So it's being imaginative sometimes. Religious groups already mentioned, across the UK it's reckoned to be about 149. In the 50s, women in work who were married were very much in the minority. By 2013, that figure has risen to 66%. A huge transformation in the la labour market. And what you'll often encounter are in certain sectors in particular, you mentioned shipbuilding, you talk about 
manufacturing in general, you'll often come across traditional attitudes which haven't moved with the times. So as well as having an outward focus on programmes, which are looking at how the services may be delivered, there's also an opportunity to look inwards and look at the culture within the organisation that's delivering that service. Is it an inclusive environment for people of different identity? Are there hidden barriers there? Have you ever stopped drawn breath? The last time I was in Glasgow, I was just mentioning this to Sarah before, was I was over with the Glasgow School of Art because they were developing a diversity strategy and they wanted to talk to me about how they could go about developing that. Because you'd imagine a, an art college, it's, it's thriving on diversity, but despite that, they were saying, no, we're actually, in terms of assessment procedures, in terms of who we let in, in terms of our staff, we may actually not be reflective of a, of a diverse community. Women's wages by 2015, it depends which part of the UK you look at. Northern Ireland, it's got the smallest gender gap of about 15%. I think Scotland's about 20% still. The gap has narrowed. It'll never disappear entirely. And one of the reasons for that is there's a fundamental difference between men and women. Men are more intelligent. No, men are more intelligent. <laughs> That's why I said it. <laughs> no, women have babies and men don't. So anything that attaches to that biological fact often goes a long way towards explaining the gender gap. And when you're again thinking about programs and projects, anything that then attaches to dependency. Dependency is not one of the protected grounds under law. The first dependency case has now been heard though and it was a case in London involving a woman working for a big law firm, Mrs. Coleman, and her son had a disability and she needed time off work to take him to hospital and the law firm wouldn't allow her time off. She brings a harassment claim under disability and it becomes the first ever what's called associative discrimination claim in the UK where you don't have to prove you're of that identity in order to bring a case. She was shown that she was associated with somebody of that identity. There's actually been a couple of um, sexual, orientation, sexual orientation cases since where somebody didn't have to prove they were either gay or straight. It was that the banter was about them being gay that was the significant issue. You see how incredibly complex all this becomes. Uh, do you know what? Current population of Scotland will be regarded as constituting an ethnic minority? Not according to the figures I looked up again last night, <laughs> just to check. 4%? Sorry, I went straight to number nine. No, the UK, I apologise. Do you know what the figure is for the UK? It's almost impossible to get it. All you get is the figure for England and Wales. Um, it's around about between 10 and 13 percent. It's hard to know. It's somewhere between those two. Sorry, Scotland's 4 percent. And then into this whole minefield again when it comes to monitoring. Because when you, it's easy enough to say oh, we, should, we should monitor by race or ethnic origin. What on earth do you ask? <laughs> do you actually want to know what colour somebody is? Do you want to know where they were born? Do you want to know which community they associate themselves with? If you wanted to look at an interesting document on this, the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland has produced a guide on monitoring and it looks at the various forms of question that you can ask in relation to each of the grounds of difference. And really what it says, it depends what you're looking for. So if you're interested in something like hate crime, place of birth may be irrelevant. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it might be and it might not, but at least what you do is you have the conversations to say, what, what do you actually want to capture here? So that could be country of origin, which again. But I'd recommend that document because it gives you all the variations there. And the last one, the figure's now 25%. It's shot up dramatically, and I think because there was a big push there, and I, I threw this one in because it actually shows what positive action can do, because it came from such a low base that 25% of board members are now women. So, I wouldn't mind moving beyond the law fairly quickly. The law is there. It protects in different ways. It, it, it extends to both employment and the provision of goods, facilities, and services. And if you can, you can see examples all over the show of what happens when people get it wrong. Again, apology is a Northern Ireland example. Invest NI, do any of you have dealings with them? Yeah. Well, this is, I, I do their equality work with them. Mr. Kadoom applies for one of their SMART awards, SMART pro, pro, program, which is about business innovation. He wants to develop water purification schemes to be exported to the Middle East. Puts in his application, and it's turned down. The client executive who works with him long and hard really struggles because his English wouldn't be great. But still he gets his application and it's turned down. Mr. Gadoom then brings a race and a religion case against Invest NI because he's a Muslim and he's originally from Iraq. And the interesting thing is when you read the decision, and I've got the copy there, is that the judge, because this doesn't go anywhere near a tribunal because now we're into GF and S. So it goes to the recorder's court in Belfast and the interesting thing with these cases is the assumption is made that you're guilty before you prove your innocence. There's an assumption that you treated this person unfairly on grounds of his identity, and you must provide what's called the innocent explanation to show, no, he didn't qualify for an award. And so what they do at that stage is they scrutinize every stage of the selection process, and wherever they find a gap, they go for them, and they end up hauling invest over the coals. And invest would actually be one of the better employers in this regard and give it really due consideration. But a couple of things they picked up on, one of which was that one of the people on the selection panel wasn't from their organisation. And secondly, she was actually from Scotland and she hadn't been trained in any of this. And that was uh, definitely seen as a, something that went against them. Sorry, this clicker's... Oh, there we go. Well, there's some <laughs> very quickly. It can hit people in all sorts of unexpected ways. Mrs. McDermott's leaning over a fence in Omer, talking to a neighbour, Mr. McKelvey. She's Catholic, he's Protestant. She lets him know she's going to sell 20 acres. He lets her know he'd like to buy. And the next thing he hears, she's sold it to a Catholic neighbour. She takes it, He takes her to the county court in Omer, has to give him £2,000 compensation for his loss, but also is required to put the land back onto the open market. He buys it at the public auction. She is then sued by the Catholic neighbour for breach of contract and has to give the Catholic neighbour £20,000 compensation, <laughs> which takes over six years for the lawyers to sort out, all brought under the fair employment legislation. And that could actually apply here just as easily. Again, the principle would be Innocent explanation. Why did you not sell it to him when you're given a verbal agreement that you would? And why did you choose a Catholic neighbour instead? Or work to the assumption that it's an act of unfair discrimination. So direct discrimination. Less favourable treatment based on a protected characteristic. Tullymore Mountain Centre. They've been through every training course under the book and they decide they've carried out a lot of research on the outdoors and who's accessing the outdoors and what they find is there's an underrepresentation of women. 
So they advertise three courses exclusively for women. One's mountain leadership, one's kayaking, and the other one was navigation. Any problems with that, do you think? Because they've got all the research to back this positive action measure. Sex discrimination legislation wouldn't allow. If it's in the context of employment, it would. If it's about goods, facilities and services, it won't. Because I actually had to get legal opinion on this one eventually, but was told, no, it cannot be exclusively for one sex. So it, the, what they told us was, we could have rejected this, these applications if, the, if we could have replied that there's a course on another day that gives the same Well, what Sport and I were told was that they could continue to run courses geared towards women, but they couldn't exclude men. And I remember a few years ago, Invest NI had an entrepreneurial program specifically designed for women entrepreneurs, and it was funded through Europe, and they had to withdraw the course. Because again, legal opinion said, no, wouldn't stand. So indirect discrimination, I mentioned this before, you apparently treat people equally, but by acting in that way, you disadvantage certain people and you cannot justify it. So it can be something as simple as a travel to work scheme or time, that where you say somebody must get to the office within a reasonable time. If you can show that, say, two communities have different access to that, you're up and running. Internal trawls, I don't know if they're an issue here at all, are they? Internal trawls for post. We had this very famous case in Northern Ireland called the McCausland case, where somebody heard of a job in local government, but he couldn't apply because he was working for the water service. He said that this indirect discriminated, indirectly discriminated against Catholics, of which he was one, because there was an over-representation of Protestants at those particular grades in local government. <laughs> the Irish are quite good at that, right? <laughs> oh, They're very well practiced, I can tell you. <laughs> did they win it? <laughs> Gold medal. Oh, did, well, oh, did they win oh, we did, yeah. Really? But it was unintentional indirect discrimination, so it didn't qualify for compensation. And coincidentally, I was running a course with the water service, and he came up to introduce himself at half-time. Tom McCausland and never met him. He actually didn't know what had happened to his case because it was taken on by the Fair Employment Commission at the time <laughs> and he just got on with his life. There's a huge industry around this, as you could imagine. But anyway, I'm, this, this, this isn't supposed to be about <laughs> Northern Ireland. It's more generally about what can be built into programmes to help promote fairness. What can you actually do? And you can look at past examples of what programmes have done in the past. If you look on page three, I'll come on to those in a moment. What I wouldn't mind you doing first of all is having a little chat about these case studies on page three. In light of what I've said so far, I really want you to test whether the positive actions that have been put in place here pass muster, whether they're problematic, whether they're okay. So it's almost like going through a checklist with each one to see if you're comfortable with them or not. And then, then we'll have a look at some which have already been done. Okay. So just within, within your tables, just to generate chat as much as anything. Don't know. Don't be afraid of saying you don't know. 
so many people try and push their way through all this, and at the end, there's been two fault. Yeah, I think, uh, I think the question is, I think you should be distracted, or you should be distracted, and if you call to this, or if you don't, that's all. Uh, and the reason that you should, like, if you get that distracted, that's the positive action you should call. So, like, if you see someone that needs, or, like, a disability or something, or an internet advantage to job from the own essential criteria, then they essentially get an interview regardless, and then after that, if the employer doesn't have to pay for it. Some organisations, no problem with others, excuse me, to say that some organisations are not going to be able to do that. Dr. Cordon is really trying to say that the rest of you have no answer to that. Thank you. 
led to that organization mm -hmm. too. So she was like, a bit like, you should say anywhere you should do the yeah. job. Shouldn't be Irish in there, obviously. Should be Gaelic, number three. I've put Irish in there, it should be Gaelic. I'm sorry, stupid. I didn't proofread. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> See on the news the other day the highest percentage of terrorists see engineers in any other profession. Because I see the word all in clear cut black and white too. <laughs> 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 Are you, are you ready to start talking about these? Yeah. It's very, despite the rigours of the legislation, it's very difficult sometimes to know wh where you cross a line and where you don't with the first one. Can you guarantee somebody an interview? 
And it depends on what, though. No, but what else? Depends on your own policy as well. If you have the double tick scheme, as it's commonly known. Right. And I don't know how widespread that would be here. Would be widespread, okay. And in some organisations, they rail against that because there's a feeling that it goes too far and you're into the territory then of positive discrimination. And we're just having a conversation about that because these become strategic decisions after a while about whether or not you're going to do more harm than good in the short, medium or longer term and what's the best thing to do within that particular culture at that time. So guarantee of an interview, it's allowed under the DDA, not all organisations do it though. Extra time to answer questions? There could be, but you would have to yeah, relate that to the person's disability. Large screen computer, buzzer, yeah, extra, time for, extra time for tea breaks. This is all about what is reasonable and what's reasonable. Just and all, all I would be suggesting at this day, I'm not going to say one's right and one's wrong, that you have those sorts of discussions and you have the mechanism in place to allow those discussions to impact on decision making as well. Because what you'll so often find is post hockery that people make it up at the time instead of having it there clearly stated how those circumstances will be addressed when they come forward. Yeah, no, it's interesting. It, uh, there's no absolutely definitive answers to this, but the, what there needs to be are conversations. And in terms of an acknowledgement within applications, say, that these issues are being addressed, they need to be made explicit. It can't just be assumed. Okay, second one. Civil engineering firm, 85% male. Following complaints... There's mandatory harassment training. Do you think you can issue a written warning and record of non-attendance? Yes, if it's mandatory training. Yeah. In the same way that, you know, with I do a lot of work around dignity at work, you often find that the, pol well, the, the thing that the policy misses out on is the kickback against people who use the policy inappropriately. Mm -hmm. If it's a mischievous or vexatious complaint, then that can invoke a disciplinary procedure. And is there a training course for
Yeah. The, the general maxim is if you, if you haven't trained people in a policy, then the policy doesn't exist. <laughs> um, you have a female image including on adverts. Okay. Yeah. Woman sub subsequently recruited as site supervisor despite being at an early stage of career with less experience. Okay. So the less, the less experienced candidate gets the job. Trainability. All this move towards competency-based interviewing is actually skewing things towards people who've already done the job. You can actually still frame recruitment around somebody's ability to learn how to do the job. So it looks at first glance as one of those you'd say no, but there could be an opportunity there to take positive action steps. Women only training? No, it's yes. No, in the context of employment, the Sex Discrimination Act says you can have women only training as long as you've demonstrated that research has shown there's an imbalance. You can't do it in the provision of goods, facilities and services, but you can in the context of employment. Mm. What about the bursary for female apprenticeships? No, I, I, I think that's where you could be in trouble because there you're providing G, F and S for one gender and not the other. You actually, there's a concrete benefit to being of one sex and not the other. Yeah. Any other issues around that one? Apologies for the next one. It should have been Gaelic where it says Irish. That's me not proofreading properly. So you're bringing together a consortium for a project. One element involves engagement with the Gale Talk community. The firm's concern that the profile of this consortium is not sufficiently diverse regarding linguistic diversity. Can you then employ a number of Gaelic speakers to address that deficit? Yeah, it is. If you well, the consultation engagement would be an integral part of the project. So you could say yes for that element of the project. You could employ, employ people almost with those particular skills. In order to allow you the quality of access. That's right. What about making all correspondence available in Gaelic and in English? Yeah. Yeah. So. And what about policies on bilingualism, trilingualism, if you're dealing with other ethnic minority communities? <coughs> Would, would, you, would you all have linguistic diversity policies, I suppose, is what I'm asking. We certainly don't have one, but would you be required to? Well, th there's a concern sometimes that it, it becomes ad hocery again. Yeah. So I can think of one organisation I work with that said if they were dealing with people whose first language wasn't English, they would engage with them in their own language, but only for six months, because there was an expectation if they were going to set a business up that they would have become familiar with English. So it was time bound. And this idea that you would provide a translation of all documents in any language under the sun can be extremely demanding of resources. So to, ha to have a policy can actually be quite a useful protection to make sure that you will, but in, reasonable and in a reasonable and proportionate way. Well, 
Right. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what about the last one? You've got a predominantly Roman Catholic workforce that decided to change senior management by recruiting more Protestants. No. No, no. no go. What about the board? Are you allowed to take positive action measures to change the board of directors? You can. You, you can take... Well, I'm not sure about the law here in particular, but I know in Northern Ireland, when it comes to representative bodies, if you can demonstrate there's a significant imbalance, you can take steps to redress that imbalance. At board level, but not at employment level? Yeah. Yeah. If it's a representative body, public bodies... Oh, yeah. Well, that would be... Yeah, yeah. Welcoming statement at encouraging Protestants to apply for the post. Yes? Welcoming statement. As long as your monitoring data has shown that there is a significant imbalance. The question you're then going to ask me is what is significant? Under UK law, you're not, a, not allowed to apply statistical tests of significance. You have to apply what's called common sense. In, Amer in America, they apply a thing called the four-fifths rule, which says that, for example, if 20 men and 20 women apply for a job and 10 men are successful, then at least eight women must be successful, otherwise you've violated the four-fifths rule. So it's... it's it's a statistical test of significant discrimination. In the UK, we've never had a case yet which has been decided on, on stats. The, the case I mentioned earlier, the McCausland case, they actually flew in a statistician from Australia whose evidence was never heard because it was decided you must rely on common sense to dictate what is a significant effect. Amazing. So you'd have, to, you'd have to have hard evidence to show that there's an imbalance before you could take reasonable steps to, to redress that imbalance. But then does it not also mean that the board of directors can make an No, it couldn't even go that far. You can just welcome applications from that community and do no more. The big exception in Northern Ireland was the police. When the PSNI was formed, there was only 17% Catholic representation. So what the pattern report said was they had to ignore the equality legislation and introduce a 50-50 quota scheme. So Catholic and Protestant applicants were treated entirely differently. So 50% of recruits came from this pool and 50% came from that pool. And you're into the whole issue then of tokenism, you're into unfair discrimination, but it was seen as a drastic step that was needed to quickly try to redress the imbalance. And they've hit 30% Catholic representation now, so that quota has now been removed. And I was working with them at the time it was introduced, I said, that is where your problems are going to start because you'll now revert to a higher intake of Protestants. And what do you do with the Catholics that are now in the system? Do you show them advantage when it comes to promotion at the sergeants' exams, inspectors, or do you just leave them into a merit pool now? So it's, it's a tricky one. Do they continue to monitor it then? They do, you so big if time. They have, <laughs> if it reduces, they will have to... Yeah. They may, may have to revert to a quota scheme again. Is that, is the system the same then as it is here that you have to do the qualification first? Or is there only like a set of qualifications after a certain period of service? Yes. So that will take in, will someone that? It will. 
but it's taken a while to hit 30% at the same time, so you've got that going in that direction. You may internally have it going in that direction. Your dignity at work policy supports the principle of a good and harmonious environment, but outlaws the displays of personal identity, e.g. football shirts, ashes and poppies. Is that okay? Right. As a, as a consequence of the Oweda case, the equality, what's it called? The GB one, so it's just going down my head. No, the commission, it's not called the commission. Sorry? Yeah, Equality and Human Rights Commission. Um, they introduced policy there on what it promotes a good and harmonious environment. Don't know if any of you have read it. It's not very specific at all. It's about general principles that should be applied. In Northern Ireland, we have a checklist of which items are or aren't acceptable in work, and that's why I put the poppies in there, because the poppies would be regarded as a mark of identity which is acceptable. Whereas Rangers and Celtic shirts aren't allowed in work. So going on the Equality and Human Rights Commission advice, I think you'd almost have to make up your own list mm -hmm. about what in your context is or isn't appropriate. Ashes would be okay. That would be a mark of identity which isn't designed to cause offence to anybody. Would a Celtic shirt? A Celtic shirt. Well, in the con all I can talk about is in the context of Northern Ireland. This is the document, which I know very well because I actually wrote it for the Equality Commission on promoting a good and harmonious environment. And it has two lists. The first list are those which are pro prohibited, including Rangers and Celtic shirts, anything linked to local politics. And it includes in that, least East, in that list Easter lilies. And because of the centenary this year, I did a, an event similar to this down at Dundalk, and it was Peace for as well as Interreg. Mm -hmm. I was then called into a meeting with the Equality Commission almost immediately afterwards, because somebody at the event, when I'd mentioned about this is where Easter lilies appears, it's part of a political campaign to get them taken out of here and put into the other list. I think it's the association of poppies has been adopted by some organisations that it's not necessarily relevant to, but can be tied in with. It is, and there we're into, is it a personal item mm -hmm. or is it a corporate item? Mm -hmm. So if you've got a big plastic poppy on your building and it's the poppy building, that's quite different than allowing an individual member of staff to wear a poppy to work. Have there ever been any poppy rows? There's been, there's been a, there was publicity of offence to people wearing poppies because there was many, many sort of associations to support of this organisation that's taken it off. Right. Can you hear okay, by the way? Yeah. I'm just asking if the back table can hear. It's taken away from the, the whole representation of what the poppy was about. And okay. Okay, so you can't go through absolutely every example under the sun, but you get the idea that what you're looking for are informed conversations about issues, and wherever possible, that it's not something which is made up on the hoof, that there is a policy position on these matters that you can stand over, and those can easily be seen as part of a programme, initiatives that are introduced under the programme. So when it comes to the questions that we're looking at later on, over the page are a few examples of earlier programmes that have tried to address some of these issues. The Peace Bridge, that was the one up in Derry. Social benefit clauses were applied and resulted in 12 local long-term unemployed people obtaining jobs for the duration of the contract. And in other ways, the contractor scheme, which was put in place at the start of the project. Ended up getting them getting an award, which isn't the important thing. It was the fact that they, they did show consideration to 
um, the people that they engaged with. The second one, the Skenos project in East Belfast. Various things were integrated into that piece of work to, to make it appeal to diverse communities. So you had Beacon House in there, a day centre supporting um, psychological well-being with various support programmes, a housing scheme which accommodated different clients, age and I, and so on. The next one, an interesting one, the Hatch Project, looking at developing entrepreneurship in the border region, north and south. There was a targeted targeting of courses on three cohorts in particular, foreign nationals, female entrepreneurs, and construction and engineering sectors. If ever you feel that you're straying over that line from positive action to positive discrimination, the most sensible thing to do is to seek legal advice. There's nothing wrong with targeting, but clearly it has to operate within the context of the legislation. Even things like over the page, part-time block, block release. <coughs> Once you have full-time requirements, say for training programmes, which of the nine grounds of difference are going to be triggered? As soon as you, you have that word full-time appear. I won't be able to bring the slide up quickly. Gender's one. Age. Age. Marital status. Could be disability. Dependency. Anybody with domestic response. All of those things kick in. Certainly, yes. Well, you can make the business case that that post, for example, isn't amenable to job share or there can't be flexibility around working hours. But, you, but rather than doing it after the event, that's where often people fall foul and this is where you get the settlements kicking in, to be honest. It wouldn't necessarily get to a case itself. Yeah. But ordinarily, it's where the policy doesn't exist, which says we will say we will make arrangements to accommodate domestic circumstances, but only where it doesn't interfere with the business interests of the organisation, say. Because there, you're back to the indirect discrimination clause. Is it a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim? So you can require somebody to be in work within a set period of time. In other words, you're defining where they can live. And if it's a reasonable condition of employment, there's no problem with that. If people are expected to work antisocial hours and the job requires that, again, it's no problem whatsoever. It's where it's ad hocery that you get the difficulty. The next one, the geotourism project, that was a, a question of engaging with various local communities and including schools, training people as geo ambassadors, and it becomes, it introduces a cross community element through a bit of imagination around a project which at first glance you would, you would say trying to introduce equal ops and good relations into this could be quite difficult. So they ended up with 20 primary schools, 19 post-primary schools from across the border region were in, engaged, and in, in, including two special needs schools. And the last one was uh, the development of Portadown Railway Station which focused, and in particular, early, early on in the project, on issues around disability access. Yeah, 
The danger is, if you do it in an ad hoc way, people tend to focus on maybe one or two aspects of difference. And what I would be trying to advocate is a much more systematic way of considering how difference can impact in so many different ways. So having auditing tools say, which okay, disability is going to be important, but you look at it alongside all these other things, and even how the different grounds of different difference then interact. Yeah, and this is where, and this is where, when it comes to interreg, this has become quite explicit now that you will be scored on these four questions. What's the likely impact on equal ops for those affected by the project? Are there better, are there opportunities to better promote equal ops? And then you've got two further questions there, which are the equivalent of the first two, but these two are now on good relations. So the first two apply across all those grounds that the regulation mentioned. The second two, the good relations questions, only apply to religion, politics, and race. And I, I don't, are you interested in where this is derived from? Probably not. It is actually section 75. The statute I mentioned, which is the equivalent of the public sector duty here. These four questions are almost identical to the questions that you apply to every policy under Section 75, and have now been enshrined in the latest government initiative on a shared future for Northern Ireland, which is a thing called TBUC, Together Building a United Community, which also in incorporates equivalent questions. So slowly but surely, all of these things are starting to come together. But these would be very familiar to people within Northern Ireland, probably not quite so familiar to you here. But what I'm suggesting to you, in terms of the work that we've looked at already, it's very often just about getting people around a table with these questions in mind and systematic ways of saying, right, how have we proposed to do business under this programme and in what ways can we integrate this into the fabric of what we're putting forward? Applying a bit of imagination, not feeling that there's a, there's a compulsion to do it, but seeing it as an integral part of doing good business. I think there's my, is there tea and coffee out there now? If you, do you want to grab a cup and bring it back in and we'll continue with this? Is that okay? Okay, thanks. Can I keep going? Is that okay? What we'll do later on is have a, have a look at how these questions can actually be applied. But it's at various stages of implementation. What lawful positive actions can be taken to promote equality of opportunity, to promote good relations, to look at things like accessibility, how you might go about encouraging diversity, how you may, at the early stages of implementation around engagement, how you reach hard to reach communities, not just going to the usual suspects, and in a, in a more global way, how through all this you try to promote inclusion. Part of this process has to involve not only looking outwards in terms of service delivery, but also a reflection. And the assessment procedure would acknowledge this element as well as the outward looking. What I've provided for you, starting on page six, is, is an example of the sort of audit tool that you can use 
to reflect on your organisation. <laughs> no, you don't have to. <laughs> Call mirror gazing. <laughs> Something that some of us do. I don't like to do at the moment. I don't need my face. I, last week I was drilling and I managed to drill into a can of, a, a spray can of grease, which then exploded all over me. So it took all the skin off my face. It was wild. It's, it's recovering now, but it wasn't much fun at the time. It must have sparked it because it just went up as a ball of flame. Oh, horrible. Anyway, lesson learned. <laughs> Yeah, don't use a drill here. <laughs> is that what you did Yeah, it's all the way up my arm as well. It's all... Yeah. Not nice. <laughs> so it's, it's fairly basic questions, but it's once again, it's the structure of the audit which is the important part. Is there something about the location? Is there something about the building? Are there particular <laughs> emblems? If you go through a walk, a walk through your organisation, which people may find offensive or introduces a chill factor? Do you get that vital support from senior management? Has there been a positive indication that there's a lot of laughing going on here? I don't know. <laughs> Okay. On which grounds? Well, some some are in safety, um, and some in the sense of well, if if you have to pay for everything and then recover it, then you're going to have to have a certain standard of living. Okay. You know, people who are, are impoverished can't apply for the job, basically. Um, you could say. Okay. So if you were to include deprivation as one of your grounds of difference in terms of an audit, it may well pick up on those examples where there's an assumption that somebody has a certain standard of living in order to meet certain job requirements. Well, they, they, essentially what's happened is that governance of it has taken over all other aspects. Right. So every other potential impact has been not considered. Right. Because the primary consideration and this is why Section 75 has been such a godsend in Northern Ireland, because it, everything has, literally everything, internal and external, has to be scrutinised to see whether there's a potential for an adverse impact. I just finished a review of Section 75 for the Equality Commission. If you go online, you can see it on their website. That re involves reviewing all 560 screening forms that are available online and all the EQIAs that are available. But there's a level of scrutiny there which it, it makes people think all the time. You don't just get away, you know, that it, it's not the important ones that are captured, it's, 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 it's everything. I'm not gonna, I don't intend to go through this line by line, but as you can see from the sorts of questions that are being asked, it's, it's, it's a health check. Do conversations die when certain people enter the room? Are those people of certain identity? <laughs> Who tends to use the coffee room? What sort of people fit? Are there certain people who move on? Do you have exit interviewing? Because <laughs> those are often so revealing if they're carried out properly. Does it work? What? If it's, if it's carried out properly and at the right time. If it's just a box tick, it doesn't. But if it's for an opportunity for somebody to give feedback on their, ex their time and their experience, yes. Very, very valuable. See the social interaction bit? Yeah. Do the employees tend to make sure they in their own group tend to their free time? I've, I've never, why? I mean, I, I don't know if it's just me. With work, I have work, I have friends. Some, there's very few all through my life. 
Yeah. And that's sometimes... It, no, but that sometimes is that contamination which can then be brought back into work, where you may have a group of people who do socialise together as opposed yeah. to those who don't. Don't know, I'd be very much in your camp on that one, about keeping those worlds apart, yeah. and where there's, there is mal-interaction between the two. It, it it causes, Yeah. Okay. Can you hear okay? If, do you want to move a bit closer? Are you okay? But no, you're okay. okay. <laughs> I do, I do mediation work, but I have zero tolerance for that now. Invoke a disciplinary action. Because yeah. <laughs> what, they, what they're doing is creating a hostile environment for everybody else. I, some of the council ones I've had to deal with are beyond belief. One of the most recent was two people who fell out, so the council put a screen up between the two desks. And then I got a phone. I spent half a day trying to sort it out. I knew I wasn't going to. I then get a phone call from one saying she turned the heater off. I'm going home in protest. A hospital in Belfast, two people fell out, so management put a whiteboard up, so they communicated via the whiteboard. <laughs> this is crazy stuff. So you mean disciplinary on both sides? Yes. Yeah. Immediate, yeah. No, but they're, they're moving in that direction, yeah. But why would you put up the whiteboard? So by putting up the whiteboard, you condone yeah. that behaviour? It's so worse. I actually said to one of them, I said to one of the parties involved, if this was the private sector, I think you'd have walked by now straight down to HR and she brought a harassment claim against me <laughs> for what I'd said. It's a very dangerous environment yeah. working. <laughs> I got caught up in a case last year in, with one of the councils, they had a guy working in their depot whose mother was Indian, actually didn't even know, but he was hypersensitive about his colour. So we brought a first charge against somebody else in the wagon because they, meant, they inadvertently said they were working like a black. The second complaint was one of them talked about a driver of a car as an effing raghead. So on both occasions, there was full training for the whole depot, disciplinary action, Third occasion, he overheard a conversation where some, a driver was retiring and somebody else said, um, I know a dark horse for your job, Jerry, and Jerry pipes up, I know another dark horse, mentions your man's name. He went straight up on the sick. Council rang me to go and speak to him just to see what we could do to work with him. Unbeknown to me, he kept his mobile phone turned on during both the interviews. So he recorded both interviews. Six months prior to that, I'd done training with all the tribunal panel members and chairs on dealing with difficult people. Do you think they would have accepted the evidence? No. They did. They said it existed so they couldn't ignore it. And it was, it was for me, it was a welcome relief, I can tell you, because he made up so many stories about what I'd said, but now I had a verbatim transcript. So, for example, he said that I told him to laugh off racism, and what I said was... You challenge it, but I would sometimes question your tactics because you make things worse for yourself. And I said sometimes a very effective way of getting your message across is to use humour. Now, I've got this full transcript now of what I said. So come the day of the tribunal, I'm taken out. Because he'd actually cited me now in the action. I was taken out of the action, and he failed to appear on the day. Seems to happen to you regular. What? Seems to happen to you regular. <laughs> I'm in the wrong job, I think. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, 
So lots of these questions, without going through them, it's about how conflict, for example, is, is managed, whether conflict is managed effectively and constructively. And you end up on page 11 with a more general consideration of where your organisation stands along this continuum between partisanship and diversity. The sad thing is, for most organisations, they begin as partisan. They were created by people who quite naturally like to recreate in their, and recruit in their own image. And what you find from that is that you get various exclusions applying. So if you take councils again, women don't appear in so many council roles. And if you look back, it could well be there was a physicality element to those roles, which doesn't exist anymore, but the exclusions still exist. Older people in work, there's an example it's from a Northern Ireland context again, but black players in football, virtually non-existent years ago where particular stereotypes were applied. And partisanship then is the actual natural state of organisations. It's what happens naturally when people recreate and recruit in their own image. The law will only ever move you to the next position, which is that of neutrality. But that can often be a very thin disguise for partisanship. Because now your recruitment procedures all look fine, but all you're letting in are the people who are like the ones who've already made it, which is quite different than having a set of recruitment procedures which allow people through the door who happen to be different in all sorts of ways. And this is where I actually began all this work back in the 80s, because I was a, le a lecturer in social, social psychology at Queen's. And it's all about the fact that organisations and groups thrive on difference. And yet all the constraints are there to, to make them the same. The social influence is all there. So what you find is a lot of people are, are naturally, in inverted commas, excluded in partisan organisations. And that audit tool is something that you could apply, you could get... And this, quite deliberately, this session is not about providing you with a toolkit to be able to answer those four questions, but, but to make you think about how you could address them. So, for example, focus groups with staff, asking them to reflect on the culture of the organisation is an inward-looking measure as opposed to one looking at actual service delivery. How far down this path do people feel you've travelled? Are you getting a clean bill of health? Or are you stuck somewhere between stages one and two? And what you find once you have partisanship, it can then manifest itself in mechanisms which are primarily designed to keep the organisation at that place and not move it forward. So bullying, exclusion, hierarchy, gradism, segregation, demarcation, that's all designed to maintain the status quo. And what you'll find with things like bullying, so often it's characterised as a personal issue and the reality is, more often than not, it isn't. It's a cultural issue where people are rewarded for that type of behaviour. So all they do is they see the ones who've got on and what they do is they mimic them. And that's one of my favourite slides. <laughs> Have you seen this one before? No. This is England playing Germany in 1936. <laughs> this is the English team here in white. You could, if you put it into Wikipedia, you'll see there was a row in the changing room beforehand, but nobody, when it came to it, did other than what they were told. Because in that, in that culture at that time, you did what you were told. And my experience of working with a lot of bullies over the years and doing a lot of mediation work would be, outside of that context, they're lovely people. They're often loyalists, insofar as they're incredibly loyal to their organisation. And they feel that, that loyalty has bought them the right to treat people in a particular way. So if they're prepared to go in early and leave late, they then look down on people who are not prepared to do the same. And they treat them often very badly. And it's so sad because it happens so often. They think when things go wrong that the organisation will throw its arms around them and give them a big hug. And they get this huge wake-up call that the organisation hasn't got a heart after all. And it makes very incredibly sad because they just left it out there in the cold. Scott, that was the view that I showed to you that night. Was that by the, by the Germans, by the Scottish, or by the English? 
the English management in the change room before them told them as a mark of respect to their hosts, they should all do the salute. And there was a lot of objection. This is people like Stanley Matthew and Bill Nicholson and all those, 1936. And, you know, three years later, they were... So neutrality, which is what the law demands, is often a disguise for partisanship, but now it looks okay. But if you've got a culture beneath that, which is favouring certain people and encouraging certain styles, then nothing changes. Um, I've, why did I throw this one in now? Because I've already mentioned it. This is the Ouida case I was mentioning earlier on. So in terms of manifestations in work of, of what may favour particular identities and not others, the Ouida case was this critical one for generating this, this guide for employers on what is or isn't acceptable in the workplace. So it's slightly tangential to what I've just been saying, but it's all about cultural matters within organisations. And the guide, as I mentioned earlier, is about basic principles, about trying to create an environment that isn't cold for people of different identity. In Northern Ireland, we've gone further with this guide, which actually sets out those things which are likely to create a hostile environment for people of certain identity. Now, clearly, this does not extend to other aspects of identity, like gender, race, disability, and so on. It's specifically about community background. But what it does say is there are lots of ways that we mark our identity which are doing nothing more than acknowledging who we are. They're not designed to be offensive, which extends to things like poppies and shamrock when worn with decorum and at the appropriate time. So if you have somebody wearing a poppy at this time of year, that's quite different than somebody wearing a poppy in November. And the way you're aiming for are organisations that genuinely and enthusiastically embrace the fact that good business is created by diverse organisations. And often this is about really simple questions, like in what practical ways do you think your work area already shows positive examples of being inclusive? How can the atmosphere be considered exclusive? When? For what types of people, what chill factors are there, and then at the end, what practical and positive steps can be taken to further promote inclusion on any of these grounds. I mentioned before about the monitoring guidance, so I'll move through this quickly. This is available from the Equality Commission from the Northern Ireland, where you need to clarify during program implementation, what needs to be monitored and when? From the earlier stages of engage engagement, who are the people that you've actually engaged with? What are their characteristics? Can you demonstrate that you've, you've captured hard to reach groups as well as those who are easily accessible? Where are, your, where are the gaps in data that you have? Are you satisfied that you have sufficient data on sufficient grounds? And you mentioned before about talking to people is often the most revealing. There's a real danger with this, that what you get involved with are numbers. And very often it's the qualitative data which is much more important when you're talking there about disability issues. It's the qualitative, it's the talking to people, which is often much more revealing than, than numbers. So it, and schematically it looks something like this. Identify functions and policies to be monitored. Identify data and gaps. Collect, collate, analyse, interpret and report. And key questions are, in relation to the particular project, what is it you need to monitor? How should you monitor? Is it best to use qualitative or quantitative data? On which grounds? Who should do it? How often should they do it? And are there other issues, maybe around freedom of information, maybe around data protection that you need, you need to take into consideration along the way? And when it comes to particular groups, what you'll find over time is that their attention has tended to focus on certain issues. So around disability, it tends to be around access, about it being included, about employment matters. With the LGB community, it tends to be around employment, 
and health and safety. For people with dependents, with children, it's around safety and facilities. Community background, it's around shared spaces and procurement matters, and so on. Particular concerns. So we move towards trying to put all this into practice. What I gave you on page 13 there is an example of a disability access audit. I assume that these are fairly commonplace anyway, are they? Would a disability access audit? Yeah. Would they be routinely included in project applications? Anyway, there's a... Hmm? Okay. But I'm just, it's an example there of the things that you would, again, just to try to make things thoughtful, the things that you may wish to consider in terms of accessing a particular facility or service. Okay, page 14. What we tried in the first workshop at this stage to get people to think about their own programmes and what could be done, but it didn't work particularly well. So what Sarah and I have worked on since are just some examples on page 14 about what you could do with each of these fictitious programmes to build in equal ops and good relations at each of the various stages. The template to use is the one on page 16. So you've got the various stages of implementation, and then across the top, the questions in terms of the promotion of equal ops, the promotion of good relations, accessibility, diversity, engagement, and inclusion. So I said I wouldn't go any later than quarter two. <laughs> so I've got about a quarter of an hour for this. Would you mind just looking at the first one then, the We Train one? So we've got about five minutes on each of these. interesting one because it was a it was a scheme designed to encourage entrepreneurs and one person on the scheme let them know from early on that he had bipolar disorder and there was there were hot desks but he would he said he could only work when he personalized the hot desks and other people were objecting and it ended up in a huge ended up in actually quite a big settlement and it was about what because the argument of the associate was that they had to create an environment that readied people for the rough world of work and they couldn't mollycoddle people. And the argument then hung on whether they'd made reasonable adjustments for this person or not. We just had a little discussion that we weren't, we weren't sure whether the person was aware that the person was going to be paying for it. So yeah, and often that it is the timing of that and about whether because really only liability will kick in once there is that awareness that there's an issue there. But they let them know that, let them know that Yeah, yeah. And what I actually had to do in that one, I had to ring round other people who'd been on the programme with a disability. And it was interesting because the first person I spoke to was another person with bipolar who'd been on the programme. And she was incredibly complimentary because she had been embraced within the culture and then I rang another guy who was in a wheelchair and his experience was quite different and he felt it was a very cold place for somebody with a disability. So, and I think what it was eventually, it was, that it was an exclusive environment. Essentially what the associate, she created an environment where people either fitted in or they didn't. And if, if she liked you basically and you're in, you were well in, but if you didn't, 
It was different. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So you could, you could, the aspect of identity may actually mask what's going on behind that, which is something about inness, who's in and who isn't. It could be based on anything, personality or interests or whatever. With this one, what sort of things could you build into an application, do you think, to show that you've taken on board this horizontal strand? So um, equality impact assessment on the projected project. So in a structured way, what you're doing is you're auditing what's there. Just on the basis of what you've got here, what do you think may come out of that audit? Well, obviously, it would be variations in the line work, the areas that you know, the, the boundaries that they're going to be working in. Yeah. Um, so has it? Has it And what about the contract arrangements with associates? So you're looking at quality control, aren't you, over the associates and a training requirement that would be built in there to make sure that they're not, it's not just about making you vulnerable, they can actually help you aspire to your stated aims. Yeah, or you might not even want to go to the stage of formalising it through an EQA, but at least there's an audit process there and there's a, a standard of competence that you would apply to ensure that people aren't going to be doing things which are untoward. And when you're involved in complex contract arrangements with service providers, to have that tangible evidence there in the application I think is quite important. Anything else? And what about the contract with the service users? Yeah. And for example, we mentioned there about conversation, that you would actually say, rather than waiting for a special need somehow to emerge, you would have a conversation with people early on to identify whether they had special needs and what reasonable adjustments could be made. Which might not just be just about disability, it may be about caring responsibilities. It's an increasing issue now with caring for elderly relatives and the constraints that places on people. So those would be very tangible ways that, that an assessor, because the assessors are going to go through this same training apparently in the autumn time, that they can see that you've made a genuine engagement with these issues. And they're not particularly costly in many ways. It's just it's a tangible demonstration that has been thought. OK, what about the second one? Just a couple of minutes, because it's coming up to 22 now. I'm going to break my contract with you. <laughs> Out of the air. I recommend it Do you? Just because it was Right. No, to be honest, I made it up. <laughs> I, obviously, I'm sort of I'm working in that yeah. sector, but it's not, no, it isn't actually based on the real one, I promise you. 
the one I just mentioned what wasn't anything it was European funded project that was a separate yeah just conscious of time what sort of things does this one hit into the, the need to have what so we've got the access access auditing procedures as well but beyond that in terms of engagement no okay and the tangible demonstration would be what of, of, of those attempts Or maybe a two or three phase engagement strategy. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's what I was trying to get. You actually, it's within an engagement strategy where you say, first of all, you might talk to representative groups about how best to access mm -hmm. particular marginalised groups and how you can best go, and go about doing that. So rather than that being implicit in what you're doing, that it's actually then made explicit. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else in that one? And then even in things like the, time, the timing of meetings and all of those things where it's... That's right, yeah. So there may be training elements involved in that as well. There may be specific training of the people who are going to carry out the engagement to demonstrate that they've got the skills and the competencies to be dealing with people of particular identity. Yeah. So the, the engagement strategy early on, the monitoring strategy that goes along with that to be able that tangible demonstration, these are the people that we did actually engage with. Okay. And last of all then, we tram. This could be completely off the wall because I made this one up as well. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> what to show it didn't work. Again, thinking through this in this systematic way, at the stage of project design, what sort of things would you like to see appearing in there in terms of this particular horizontal strand? So it could be some sort of surveying of people's experience of getting around mm -hmm. of different language needs. And then when you're talking about things like focus groups mm -hmm. and you're talking about accessing different communities, again, a tangible demonstration that those have been constructed in such a way that all the voices can be heard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've just finished a project with the Equality Commission and it involved a series of focus groups and what I was finding during the groups that there wasn't consensus around the table so the focus groups themselves weren't working so what we introduced as well as that was a thing called EARS 
it's an audience response monitoring system. You know these ones where you press a button? Mm -hmm. So at the end of each stage of the discussion, this thing flashed up and you can see on the screen immediately people's responses to each of the questions. Really, really useful. I think there's a danger with focus groups that you hear the people with the voice. That's right, yeah. You could. And what essentially what you're ending up with is a blend of quantitative and qualitative research to identify particular needs which can then be built into the implementation stage through, through to monitoring beyond that in terms of what has actually worked and scope for adaptation as well. Okay. So I think the, the one word that hopefully is emerging from this is about a systematic approach, not about ad hoc it's about looking at all the ways in which people differ and all the ways then this can be accommodated with, within emerging projects. If you wanted to look at some useful practical guides on this, this one's a really good one, the Big Lottery Fund one, I don't know if you've seen this, the Quality Matters, a good practice guide, full of lots of good practical advice. The other one is one from a Northern Ireland one, about looking at ways that you can promote fair play, but that's in the particular context of sport. But there may be a few examples you could extract from that. And the contacts, the Quality and Human Rights Commission, and there, there are the websites. So, it's just about me. I'll hang around if anybody's got any questions afterwards anyway. Or um, I can let you have my email address as well if that's useful. It's just j.kremer. Oh, it's there. <laughs> <Got it anyway. laughs> well, thank you. It's very easy. <laughs>